sort of start with, where we get to at the end of the um, of the uh, workshop, that'll um, that'll depend on all of us and the community and the conversations we have. So just to run through the agenda quickly, um, I hopefully back ten fifteen we'll have um, uh, Budman Manasni from Sydney Uni uh, lead us off with a bit of a context of of where we are. And, and what it's and what emitted infrared is and where they're going and then hopefully from about 10 30 we've got um, some participants that have um, indicated they wouldn't mind um, giving us a five minute rundown of where they are in their laboratories or, or, or their organizations um, there's the lists the the run list so please take a bit of a note of where you are and um, so that you can prepare yourself ready for it it'll be an interesting what time and then um i think after that i think we'll probably all need a little bit of a 10 minute break just to um do whatever we have to do and then come back pretty quickly and we've got some um some uh hopefully we've got some um presentations from um uh, people that are developing and and some projects major projects that are, are running around at the moment in the region um, just to give us an understanding of um, where we might be able to later on find some areas of collaboration in those projects and between individual laboratories that would be good and then at the end hopefully we'll have time to wrap up and talk about well where do we go from here what uh, what's the next steps uh, how do we progress um, our our community um, into the future. Okay, so I guess why are we here, and how do we get here, and, and why why is ASPAC involved? And for those who uh, are new to it, the Australasian Soil and Plant Analysis Council was formed in about 1990, and um, we're a non-profit organisation um, that um, and incorporated. And our objectives are, are, are pretty plain. And the ones that we sort of really want to um, uh, focus on today is, the, you know, encourage the, and promote the adoption of, of methods. And we're facilitating a national and international communication. And we want to really get into the collaboration and stimulate that training. Um, so what we're doing today meets very closely with the objectives of ASPAC in the end. Some of our activities, well, we've got the um, the inter-laboratory inter proficiency trial that we that ASPAC runs. And I believe in the next trial, we, um, we have the option to, you, to put uh, total organic carbon and total nitrogen um, as um, uh, by MIR or NIR. You can select those and add and submit results uh, for that. Um, Roger, I give give me a thumbs up that that's correct. I was just wondering about that, Rob. We've been talking about it. But if you've heard that, then maybe yeah, it slipped my mind. We haven't had a meeting for a little while, so yeah, maybe that's the case. But I can't. I don't oh, actually. Well, we'll I'm to confirm confirm. That is the case. We've already been given the invite and accepted it. Thanks, Bruce. And yeah, it sounds like it's on, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And so, um, and also, um, the third dot point is very important, and that's uh, promoting the adoption of uniform technology and the terminology in soil and plant analysis. And that's to try and get us some interoperability of data. And I think. That's where you know Peter and um, Glosis and uh, in an, um, information systems are really really keen, and particularly the uh, the, the um, um, to, uh, global soil partnership because they want to get a better understanding of um, of soil condition across the world. And one of the most important things is that the data is actually consistent. Um, so we're conducting workshops. That's good. <laughs> tick that box and we want to actually support relevant research and the best way because we're a non-profit the best way we can do that is to try and get people together in a collaborative um, a way and make connections and networks 
So that's good. So again, where do we fit? Well, we fit within the Global Source Partnership and particularly down here in Pillar 5, the harmonisation of methods. So you can see how ASPAC fits in with the aspirations of the Global Soil Partnership because we have basically the same values and the same objectives. And we're going to go through this pretty quickly. So for goodness sake, if you want to know more information, uh, get onto the website. And you can see this little map down the bottom. The Global Soil Partnership is set up into regions. And this blue area down here is where we're really interested in, and that's the Pacific Soil Partnership. And that's where um, we're also um, um, hooking in uh, with our Pacific nations and and uh, New Zealand and Australia. Well, can I just break in because I don't think yep. you're sharing a screen if you think we're seeing stuff. Oh, OK, sorry. Unless Someone's everybody else is and I'm not. No. Yeah, no, you're not sharing. Someone kicked me out. That's all right. We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. That done? Yep, thanks. Sorry about that, folks. Please, um, please help me if I that sort of stuff. So, anyway, I won't go back to the start. I've spoken about everything. Um, and um, okay, so it's all partnership. We got to there. Pillar five. The region is um, is um, the Pacific region, and part of that uh, pillar five. For the global soil partnership is, is the global soil uh, laboratory network and when we established in 2017 and again as you can see from that the aspira the um, objectives of uh, global and fit very very comfortably with um with aspects objectives with this is brand new straight off the roach so there's over six, it's around about 670 laboratories now uh, registered with um, the Global Soil Laboratory Network, and we cover everything. And as you can see, in the um, in the Pacific region, we've um, gone under the auspice of ASPAC. We've been around for 30 years. We know what we're doing. We're doing pretty well. And you can see there that there's the 77 laboratories in the um, in the region that are registered with Glosalin, and that includes the Pacific nations, New Guinea. Australia and New Zealand. So Glosalin have been looking and the GSP are very keen to um, explore uh, NIR and MIR spectroscopy because they see it as a possible opportunity for developing countries to get a bit more, uh, well, I suppose it's easier, it's cheaper to put a $25,000 spectrometer than try and build a a chemistry laboratory in in some of these developing countries and so can this can this um, technology be used as a surrogate for uh, chemical analysis uh, to assist um, the interoperability of, of data throughout the throughout uh, the world and particularly in developing countries uh, again for more information uh, and how it's all been set up and how it's uh, focus, uh, functioning at the moment I, um, I'd send you to the um, to the website. Um, 25th of September, 23rd, 25th was the first plenary meeting in soil spectroscopy. Um, so um, there was 350 participants from 63 countries involved and quite a few, um, a very busy PowerPoint and I'll leave that for you um, to, to work through. But basically the, the structure and the governance of it is through a working group of, um, of people from ISRIC and Africa and USDA and I believe some of the guys from New Zealand and Australia have been in communication with that working group. Um, I think Pierre and Brendan and, and, and others, if I missed anyone, sorry. And so they're really pushing forward with it um, and looking to see how we, um, how, we, how we build on it. And this um, workshop is probably our initial uh, foray and um, and dip your toe in the water. So some of the initiatives that they're um, they're looking at is to build a globally represented calibrated soil spectral library. Now we can all have our opinions on that, but that's where we're going. They predominantly only um, utilise uh, USDA Kellogg's um, soil survey laboratory 
um, and they're offering for uh, to Kellogg to um, have them analyse and um, and uh, spectra a spectra written um, free of charge to build this global library. Um, so they're really wanting to see if we can harmonise. Obviously, for building spectra libraries, harmonisation is very important. You um, you need to um, all be doing the same process, and we understand that there's some issues there, and also to develop the the capability in labs. But as we all know from those initiatives, there are some uh, major elephants in the room, and um, hopefully um, I. I'm not going to uh, sit here and, and list those elephants. We're thinking probably during the day that they'll all surface and people will have the opportunity to, to list some of the issues that they see in, in, the, in the initiatives that are going on on the global scale. That doesn't um, uh, hook us in to actually having to um, um, follow that, but um, I do note, and you will see, and I didn't have time to um, update it, but they are looking at a federated system and now what federated system means to different people are and that is to uh, eventually drop down to regional and then national uh, libraries and and um, and um, evaluation systems so that's that's um, why we're here uh, we're starting um, and it's really great and as uh, Peter alluded to before, it's quite encouraging to see so many people interested in the subject and wanting to, um, to have some involvement. Right. So, that's very good. Um, so I'll leave that there. Um, I'll stop sharing my, my screen. And um, I'll just call to see whether uh, Budiman is with us. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Budiman. Uh, well, I'll um, hand it over to you now. Thanks. Can you hear me all right? Yes. OK, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Rob, for initiating the workshop and give me a chance to speak. Rob asked me to give a brief presentation about the status of the infrared uh, spectroscopy. Uh, so I'll just talk more about mid-infrared spectroscopy, I think, because I think the the glossolan and all most of the most of the research is heading how to share content share. This one, can you see my share screen? Yes, Budman, thanks. Yeah. Okay, all good now. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, so I'll just talk a bit about the uh, mid infrared spectroscopy, what we've been doing, and what we think the, there might be some synergies and uh, working together. So as you say that the as uh, Rob says that it's it's not a new thing, but it and, and, and in fact, Australia should be proud because that's more than twenty years ago that Les Yannick and colleagues Yam Skemstad in Adelaide has said that can mid infrared refraction spectroscopy replace soil chemical analysis. So we are still in a, after 20, more than 25, 20 years that we we're, we're still looking at this uh, mid infrared. So it's it's a progress, I hope. So because mid-infrared, here, here I'm talking all about uh, mid-infrared, not near-infrared. So what, and what I'm talking about is mid-infrared for laboratory studies, uh, not, in the, not in the field. So, so what I meant is that if we take the samples, and as usual, if you send your samples to the lab, can we do uh, mid-infrared and predict all the properties instead of going through all the chemical, different chemical analysis? Because mid infrared contains a lot of information that is lost or that is not translated to the in the near infrared regions. For example, you can directly see the different minerals and different characteristics of the spectra. Just looking at the spectra, you can notice around 3600 wave number. 
it tells you immediately that you're looking at whether it's a kaolinate base or a monomorylinate base or spectrite based uh, soil. So the first thing that we try to look at more regionally in Australia, that was a, uh, that was in 2009, 10 years ago. So we we work together with uh, 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 people from New South Wales. Uh, that's uh, at that time is I don't know where OEH, and we got some of the samples from the archive, and then we also have samples from the uh, Queensland uh, DPI. We got the samples from the archive, and then there's also another set of samples, which is from a survey by Jeeves et al. that is in the width belt of the north, uh, south of New South Wales and also cross in the border of Victoria. So we got three three different data sets that cover quite a large area. So we want to see like, so how one data set translates to the other and so on. So for the Queensland's data set, we are very happy with it. We got a very good prediction of clay content, uh, CEC and organic carbon. And uh, this is on the validation data set. That means that this this data this data is not used in the training, so this was set aside. So it's it's very good. But then we look at how do we uh, what if we swap it? So we then use the Queensland spectra, but then we we do the same thing with the New South Wales data, and we calibrate it against New South Wales data, and then we use the New South Wales calibration and predict it on the Queensland soil or Queensland Queensland spectra, we can see that uh, immediately that the, that the high accuracy as we expected earlier cannot be seen anymore. It, it's still quite good, but it's it's the accuracy is not at that high anymore. And even worse is, is that if we use the Queensland calibration and then predict it to the New South Wales spectra, then we can see that the predictions even worse. So you can say that the soils in Queensland and uh, New South Wales is uh, different. Some of it may be true, but I think a lot of it is also to do with the, how we analyze the standard, how we analyze the samples, and I think there's also some variation in the in the methodology, which I think in the in in within the CEC as as well, I think there's some some differences. So that's that's I think one thing that we need to be aware of, and and this is using the same spectrometer. So we are not talking about uh, different spectrometers. This is using the same spectrometer, but uh, we 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 can expect some of the variation that uh, if we do one transfer of the other. I think this is something that we can talk about later. And then recently we got uh, in touch with the USDA. Uh, NRCS, that's the their Kellogg Soil Survey Laboratory, which uh, Rob had mentioned earlier. So they they started this a few years ago. So they they got a good uh, sets of uh, database. They got a good sets of database, and and the good thing of that is that all their all their lab analysis is done by by the same lab, or at least using a standard methodology from the. Uh, NRCS and I think this is all done in the same lab using a very standard laboratory and it it it's it it is well documented the the MIR procedure is well documented the standard operating procedure is well documented so we look at this data and say that since we got this much of data this week about 17 thousand profiles I think uh, overall in terms of samples is more than a couple hundred of thousands. So we look at this. So we got this much data. So what can we do out of it? Because uh, at the moment there's a lot of uh, machine learning or smart algorithms that's going on. But those, those one of them is what we call as deep learning that recognize pe uh, people's face, like your Facebook friends. That's because they use deep learning. It's because that they need. If you have a lot of data, a lot of data, they can particularly look at very detailed, very detailed uh, relationship that that may be missed in a more general machine learning method. So we look at this, whether there's something in this deep learning that that will be advantage for big data set if if we collect a lot of data. So the idea is that they that they take the spectra and then do a, a kind of filtering, a kind of window filters that they look through the different regions of the spectra. 
and then it fill, fill, fit it into different types of filter and then go into a neural network. So there's a lot of connection. There's a lot of parameters that you can play around. But ultimately, what it does is predict the soil properties. So here we look at uh, one, two, three, four, six soil properties that we know that it's it's going to predict well because we know that this is from the literature. And again, this is on the mid infrared spectrum. So we compare it on the usual, on the standard method, the partial least square methods, and then another method, machine learning method that is called QBIS, which is a regression tree method. And the last one, the CNN is the neural network model. So overall, what we say is that on average, it's 37% we can achieve with this uh, new method. With, with a large data set, we can achieve 37% uh, more accurate than the usual method, and then it's about 22% percent more accurate than the regression machine learning method. But despite this, what we can say is that overall, even if you just use PLSR, the prediction is very, very good. And you see, can see that the R square is all above 0.9, or except pH for PLSR. All, all the R square is above 0.9. So this gives us, us a, and this is on a validation set, which are not used in the model, which gives us a confidence that this can be used as a routine routine analysis. And even just predicting this, uh, these values that we know that it can predict well, total carbon, organic carbon, CEC, clay, silt, sand, and pH, that's already saved a lot of time and a lot of money because this is from one single spectra that we can predict with very accurate, very highly accurate, very confident with very confidence that we can do this well. So now and then the next question is that we got this big data set. It got about a hundred different soil physical, chemical, and biological properties. What what else can we do except the one that we know well already? pH, CEC, and texture, and carbon. So now we look at it and here, and uh, I have to say that we only model mineral soils. I know uh, it's a bit strange to talk about organic soils in Australia because in the US database there, there's a lot of over representative of their organic soils. So we remove all the organic soils and here we only model mineral soils. And we look at the chemical and physical properties and our proposition is that not all properties can be predicted well. There are properties that are we know well can be predicted. That is properties related to the mineral and organic components and the surface chemistry of the soil. But if it's properties related to the soil solution, which depends on the extraction chemistry, we don't expect it to predict well because the MIR cannot see the soil solution. It it see because you are give you us you are submitting your samples as uh, on your grind soil, the soil of on the on your ground ground soil. So beside those, uh, I'll just I'll just highlight a few of them. Is that uh, different forms of uh, aluminum and different forms of iron. So this is more when people look at not just a uh, total iron, total aluminum, and some people want to do at different forms of uh, extractable, uh, like oxalate ex extractable or diatomate citrate, citrate extractable. This is more for mineral works. This is more for people look at different forms of uh, iron and aluminum. So we can actually predict it quite well as well. And but things that are to do with extractions like uh, electrical conductivity that we extract and all these chemicals, uh, the nitrate, the nitride, the ammonium that is extracted uh, in this case by saturation ex extraction, we cannot predict it that well, which which makes sense. I think this is uh, the things that are in the soil solution extracted in the soil solution that we can't do it quite well. And then phosphorus. Water soluble phosphorus, either brave phosphorus or coal phosphorus, or Olsen or mainly uh, different types of extraction, it cannot well be well predicted. As we said before, this that depends on the different types of solution. But the one that it can be predicted well is the phosphorus retention, which is of course related to the chemistry or the surface chemistry related to the clay mineralogy of how it absorbs the phosphorus. For some reason, it's called New Zealand phosphorus retention because New Zealand 
and so on has lots of phosphorus retention. So it predicts very well, which is which is a plus because uh, having this phosphorus retention, especially in New Zealand, is important for their volcanic soils. It's probably can can be expensive in a in a in in the measurement. And we look at the elemental concentration. So this is in terms of total element concentration. And we can see that even all the major elements, all the major elements, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, potassium, magnesium, can be well predicted. And I think this is two things. One is that they are major elements, so they exist in a large amount in the soil. But as you see that once this is a range from the high highest concentrations to the lowest concentration. But once we are in the trace element, because the smaller amount of materials, I don't think the then the predictions gets worse. I think this is to do with the amount as well. So it's not just uh, the element, but also the amount. And something like calcium iron is very, very well predicted. So, and in terms of organic matter, we know it all well that carbon nitrogen uh, different forms of carbon even carbons in the particular organic matter is well predicted and that's i think that's about the chemistry and then we look at also physical properties and our proposition that if it's based on the soil this similar but based on the solid solid composition whether it's related to the surface mineral or the, or the organic minerals it can be predicted well, but if it's something to do with pore space relationship, it shouldn't be. There's, there is no reason why it can be predicted well. So one of the famous cases we all argue this all the time is bulk density. Everyone says that it can predict bulk density. Yes, it can predict bulk density, but I think the uncertainty is still quite large. I think the the range we're looking at, for example, here the error is is uh, around whatever. 0.1 of a unit. So as an indication of the bulk density, I think it can be it can be OK, but uh, it's not going to be a replacement for the actual bulk density. And finally enough that the aggregate stability that some some studies show it's well predicted. It's in this case it's not that well predicted. But again, that could be. And then the, the other thing is water retention. There's, uh, I, I have lots of argument this time about this. So, but water retention, I think we also need to know how the water retention is measured. A bit of uh, soil physics, basic soil physics. So, water retention, if it's uh, if it's wetter than one third bar of of fill capacity, it's usually measured on the clot samples. You can't measure it on the sieve sample. If it's measured on the sieve samples, you are overestimating because that is a uh, you are measuring about the the absorption capacity of the of water in the sieve samples, but if it's a clot samples, it has to take into account the the structure of the soil. So most of the water retention to be meaningful, if it's fill capacity or wetter than fill capacity, then it has to be on the clot samples. As you can see, if it's sieve samples, it can predict it very, very well. So if it's the sample, you sieve it and then you put water and equilibrate it on the pressure plate, you can estimate it very well. But if it's to do with the pore space relationship, because the way the structure is arranged, that it's there's no there is no logic that the MIR, which you ground pass through very fine sieve, that you can predict uh, what's happening in a clot, which makes sense. Right. So. You can still predict it, but I think that it, it's a kind of pedo transfer function. It still can be predicted, but it's it's something to do that uh, it still have a large uncertainty compared with something that is at a 15 bar or wilt, what we call wilting point. Wilting point, it doesn't uh, rely on the pore space. It's more about the absorption of water on the soil surface, so you can predict it well. In summary, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for mid infrared as a highly accurate measurement of many soil physical prop chemical properties in the lab. So, if someone submit a sample in the lab, so just with a scan, I think mid infrared can offer a lot of uh, information, a lot of soil properties, which which traditionally it will probably cost a lot of money to do all these uh, 
all of this analysis. But also, we have to uh, also acknowledge that not all soil properties can be uh, predicted, so we can't overpromise that it will predict all the nutrients. It can predict the total element, but not the available nutrients. I think that's about it. Thanks, everyone. If oh no, oh, there's one more thing. There's an upcoming book I have to I have to share with you. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, about the soil spectral inference. So uh, with colleagues and uh, with uh, Brandon and colleagues from Sydney University, we have uh, written a book about the soil spectral inference with R. That means that. Uh, uh, of course, you can do this with the proprietary software, but if you want to do more out of it, if you want to make it a routine, uh, you want to be able to code it up and and there's a lot of confusion which method to use and how do you do it. So we put it all together. So it's upcoming and uh, it will be published in uh, February 2021 and I look forward in sharing with you. I think there may be a chance that we can probably do this as a course or online course or something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Budiman. Um, as you can see, we're probably already heading over um, <laughs> over time. Um, we might. Um, is so. Is there anyone got any burning questions that they want to um, pass through? If you have, possibly um, keep an eye on the chat and. Um, and, and put them in there. And Budiman, if you'd like to keep an eye on the chat and answer any questions that might be uh, directed to you, that would be great. Yes, well. yes, we can keep communicating on the on the chat if you have. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess the next the next little bit uh, of the program is um, is getting some understanding or, or some experiences from individuals that are actually operating or using the the um, the, the technology. So, Kyle, are you um, ready to go? Uh, hold on a Whoops. Sorry. All right, let's try that again. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yep, we can hear you, Roger. All right, OK, uh, hold on, I'll just try and share my screen. All right, looks like that's working. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Everyone hear me all right? Sure, can we? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. It. So, okay, so uh, I've only got five minutes, so I'll, I'll uh, probably be pretty quick, but um, uh, I'll just zoom through this. So, yeah, we've been using NIR for about 15 years uh, in our lab. Um, we uh, started off with, with plant testing, but soon got into soils. Uh, we have three NIR instruments currently, two, two Broca MPAs and one Broca matrix. So we do a wide range of of analytes on our, on our plant and feed and, um, yeah, uh, quite a few on soils and we're sort of always adding to this list as we as we go. So for for soils, we're doing an available nitrogen. It's a um, a nitrogen test in New Zealand, also called the anaerobically mineralizable nitrogen. Total nitrogen, total carbon, total sulfur, uh, anion storage capacity, or that's that's the phosphate retention that was talked about in the uh, last presentation. It's it's also called anion storage capacity in New Zealand. So that's that's one of the things we currently offer in our soil profile. Um, and another sulfur test, the extractable organic sulfur, which is the difference between sulfate and total sulfur and on a, a, an extract. Um, so in terms of sample preparation, we are, it's just a standard sample prep in our lab for, for plants and soils. So soils are dried less than 40 degrees overnight and ground through a two millimetre sieve. And we basically just present it to the two instruments as is like that. We used to fine grind soils for, um, for NIR instruments, but that significantly limits the, um, I guess the, 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 the use of it. It increases the cost quite a lot. And so uh, worked out we didn't actually need to do that. So yeah, since then we are just doing the two mil dried sieve sample uh, through, the, through the NIR. So the MPA is using the carousel system. 
it's an integrating spheres type of um, you know shining light from underneath. Uh, the matrix is actually on our automated tapping robot. Uh, we've probably got some videos of that somewhere, so if anyone wants to see that, we can. Or if you've seen it before, come into our lab. Um, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. But our matrix instrument is basically part of that, and it's on a conveyor belt type system. And almost every soil that comes through our lab gets an NIR scan based on that particular instrument and device. So in terms of our calibrations, um, we actually don't just use NIR. This is something that we've been doing for a while is, is actually, I mean, when you're doing these sort of things, it's just a statistical multivariate measurement. And NIR really is just one thing you could throw in the mix. And so it's something we've done internally is, well, what else can we, can we add to NIR to uh, improve our calibrations? Um, so I did a bit of work on this uh, many years ago, looking at what it actually does and how it works and what, what we can add in terms of you know, cheap measurements in our lab that will improve our NIR calibrations. Um, the discovery is basically it's kind of acting as a bit like an internal standard in the NIR. If you, if you add like a low cost measurement, like even just a uh, crude bulk density of the sample into it, it actually significantly improves your NIR calibration. So that's something we've been doing many, many, many years now. Um, our methodology in terms of calibration is typically a local weighted PLS uh, bootstrapped or, or bagged around that. So it's a, it's a bit like a, a random forest or something along those sort of lines. Um, but there's tens of thousands of samples in, in the calibrations. Is, so they're typically quite large calibrations. Um, and, and then using the local weighted technique, which so it's on the fly creating these you know, small population calibrations for each individual sample. Uh, I'm just blitzing through this. So if you've got any questions, perhaps email me afterwards or we can we can you know, talk about it if you want more details. Um, another thing we, we do is we actually redirect a large amount of samples to our reference methods. So it's, it's a bit like the using the Mahalanobis distance or the Q residual and those sort of qualifier statistics. But we do take that to an extreme where we actually don't trust the NIR methodology very much. And we, um, so we have a, quite a tight uh, limits on our, on our thresholds. And we re end up redirecting about 20% of our cases to the reference methods. So the way that um, we, I guess, sell NIR results, we sell like the package or total carbon. We will do a NIR scan first. And if we, we think that's good enough, we'll you know, offer that result. If we don't trust it, we redirect that to the reference method at, at our cost to provide the customer with you know, the best quality um, result we can, I guess. Um, finding the sweet spot between cost and quality, I, I guess you could say. So uh, common problems. I mean, the biggest problem from my point of view, um, I read a lot of papers. I'm part of the, the Journal of Near Infrared um, editorial board. Um, and so the biggest problem I see is that it's the, it's in the scope of the method. It was hinted at in Budiman's talk as well around uh, looking at the New South Wales versus the Queensland calibrations and how it you know it falls over. This is something you see all the time with near infrared. Is that on a, on a small scale on a single farm or something like that, it will look really really promising, and then as soon as you go somewhere else, it kind of falls over. And the reason for this is that it's very matrix dependent the method. And so what is your scope of your method? What's your scope of your calibration? What's included and what's validated is all your NIR calibration is going to work for, which is why we have tens of thousands of samples. We've got samples from across New Zealand and all our calibrations. And even then, we, you know, we still operate it with quite a low level of trust, really, which is why we redirect a lot to the reference methods. It's, it's, it's often indirect. I mean, what are you actually measuring is probably not what the NIR is building its calibration on. So it's something to, to consider, um, you know, particularly things like elemental analysis and things like that. Like, you know, what's the, the science behind how NIR is measuring that is, is certainly a, a, a question. I mean, even from a, a matrix, uh, an analyte point of view, something like total carbon, NIR and mid-infrared, their molecular techniques and measuring the molecular vibrations of, of, you know, what's in the sample. And so what makes up total carbon is not just one type of molecule. It's, you know, in something like soil, it could be all sorts of different types of molecules. And so whenever you change the sample type and you're changing the what makes up total carbon, your NIR shouldn't work. I mean, the way that, that um, you know, that it's going to measure will, will no longer work for that new sample. So this is the why it's, it's a very matrix-dependent uh, method. 
all right. Is there anything else? So just to round off with, um, uh, I guess, a, a total carbon this is, um, that we have in, in our lab. Um, so this is, it, it's, it's kind of like a validation set, but it's, it's kind of more than that. This is our live ongoing performance check. So as, as also swapping, the redirecting the poor quality ones to the reference method, we also take a, a random sample of the good ones that we, and just randomly always picking like one in 20 to redirect to our reference method as a quality control check. So this is what we internally call our, our alternative method check. And so this is just ongoing, you know, what what is the NIR performing right now? Um, and so this is all the cases we've done for total carbon over the last, I don't know how many years, this is maybe three or four years that we've, we've pulled out for this quality control check. Uh, that's me, I guess that was pretty quick, but um, yeah. Oh, thanks, Carl. That's great. Yep. Did someone else want to speak? No. Nope. Okay. So, Carl, if you stop sharing, we good. And Mano, are you ready to go? Rob, I'm just uh, having some problem sharing them. Um, let's see whether. Um, Rob, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, I'm trying to. That's the one. Yeah. And then click on that. All right, so click on it again, and it should come up with some windows. And you select your window for your PowerPoint. So click on that little box again. Yeah. Can you see me? Can you see? There we go. Well okay. done. Sorry. That's no, all right, mate. <laughs> okay. Um, it's all new to all of us. <laughs> uh, I'll go through quickly because the title is quite big. It says. Uh, uh, predicting soil properties, I made infrared uh, spectroscopy because initially Rob asked me to present this one for 15 minutes, so I tried to minimize as possible. Um, so, as um, previous speakers mentioned, the FIR, uh, MIR, or um, FIR is basically a molecular vibration. Um, so, we need to have the um, molecular fingerprint to get uh, accurate results. So as Budi mentioned, EC was not working because some of the elements are not IR sensitive. It need to be IR sensitive or it has to be a proxy. So that's one of the reasons some of the uh, predict predictions are failed. So why we started with this one for our um, laboratory purpose, uh, point of view, um, we were involved in the CSRO project with the carbon fractionation. Uh, as you can see, uh, the carbon fractionation um, for the resistant organic carbon costs more than $1,000. So that's why CSRO uh, developed the carbon fractionation uh, with the MIR to see whether they can reduce the cost. So how we did it, uh, we, have, uh, we are based in the Yanko soil slab where we have more than 80,000 samples. Each sample is archived and uh, associated data is stored. So we use some of the samples from the archive, we use the puck mill to grind the samples and Perkinelma spectrum one to scan the uh, infrared, uh, mid infrared sector. So how the data look like this one, uh, we do some pre-processing like SNV or DTRAN if needed, it's based on um, the output we get in the modeling program. So not always pre-processing is necessary, but sometimes it's very helpful as you can see for the carbonate pre-processing help to uh, improve the peaks. Um, this is the calibration. We jointly developed, uh, contributed to the CSRO 
um, carbon fraction calibration, where total organic carbon, particulate organic carbon, humus, and resistant organic carbon was predicted using 200 sample because uh, it's extremely expensive to do the NMR analysis. So as you can see, um, POC, ROC, HOC quite well predicted in this one. Um, so uh, how do we validate? We validated using uh, the CSRO provided 80 different sample. Each, we all participated in this uh, program and each lab developed their own calibration. Uh, as you can see, the TOC is as expected is 0.99 uh, and the POC is a physical fractionation. So it's a low one. And then the humus and ROC is well predicted. So rather than paying $1,000 with the MIR, we can simply predict within one minute, it's much faster. Um, so this is a typical example where MIR is extremely valuable and helpful tool for the prediction. Um, then we had some other, um, like um, organic carbon, it's well established. We used a large amount of samples. Um, here I use um, seven, almost 750 samples. Um, and then equally equal amount of uh, samples like for the external validation. And it's provide RMSP 0.2 and uh, RSQ 0.97. So it's a good validation. We also, so as in the previous slide, you can see there's a, a data gap between six and eight or all the data is accumulated below four. So I um, re-model that one to less than 3% carbon to see that one improve the RMSEP. Uh, and we also build up the nitrogen. It was working quite good. And also the carbonate calibration, it's really working good. And uh, the pH calcium chloride, if we remove some of the outliers in the particular one, uh, we were able to get uh, nearly 0.9 R squared. As Buddy said, it depends on the soils too. Um, then we validated this uh, pH calcium chloride using around 100 samples, and it's giving a good R squared. Uh, some of the problems uh, I'll go through quickly. Grinding can can some effect on the spectra, as you can see, spectral difference. It's all depend on how much accuracy you need. So by grinding, we can substantially improve the accuracy and the predictability, but we can still use the two millimeter C fraction. The other one which really affect is the moisture. We need to be really aware of the moisture. Um, by 20% moisture, you can see here, basically we lost all the spectra. So moisture is one of the other important one. Uh, in this PLS, there are some pitfalls uh, like moisture um, uh, gr grinding and other one is modeling. We need to be careful with the overfitting. Uh, you can see from this one, the first one I used 15 factors and the second graph I use only seven factors. Both of them give almost 0.9 R squared, but if we use the 15 factor modeling for prediction, it may fail in the uh, um, soil which are out the, outside the calibration space. Uh, overfitting is a serious problem sometimes because we try to get a better R squared. Uh, so uh, in brief, uh, there are pitfalls. This is based on my user experience and other literature. Particle size is a critical one. Moisture, um, curvilinearity is a, another serious problem when we build the model. For example, carbon, if you have a high range of carbon percentage, the curve become curvilinear. So we, use, uh, we actually score the data um, um, to get this one um, build linear. And the collinearity is another problem within the fraction. For example, in the carbon fraction, current CSR or carbon fraction, there's a high collinearity. Normally, the PLS or multivariate can handle collinearity, but after a certain threshold limit, it can become a problem where you can even use a simple multiple regression rather than the multivariate analysis. Then as I mentioned, overfitting and underfitting can cause a problem. And the other problem I experience is extrapolating beyond the calibration space. Uh, the last one is the instrumental difference. Calibration transfer is a serious problem because one instrument to other, um, we need to have we should be able to transfer without losing any accuracy. Uh, finally, 
MIR is not just one of uh, calibration building. It's a continuous one. Whenever we have unknown sample, we need to add that one and to improve the ca calibration validation. Currently, we are working on other uh, soil uh, physical parameters such as linear shrinkage, volume expansion, uh, and piece option and other properties. Thank you. Sorry, I was really rushing through to cover this one. Hello? Yep, that was excellent, Mano. That was really, really good. And um, I was I was going to have an elephant trumpet somewhere in the middle as those ele elephants in the room start appearing in some of these presentations. So that's excellent. <laughs> Sorry, um, I was rushing, but I hope you no, were was, able to grab no, it. No, it was yeah, really okay. good. So if you can um, uh, unshare your screen. Yeah. And I can call on Ryan and Uta once that's done. That little box. Uh, uh, I'm just uh, because I have two other screens, oh. so it is moving around <laughs> everywhere. Sorry. <laughs> Extremely sorry. Look, I don't have any slides, so I can just start talking. Right, excellent out. way you go. <laughs> I'll try and get you back on track, Rob. Um, Are you? <laughs> <laughs> look, I, after, after man, both Manos and Booty's talk, there's probably not that much I need to say because you both introduced Syro's long history of, of work in this space um, and also my personal interest in the carbon fraction um, predictions in particular. Thanks, Mano. But I just want to acknowledge first and foremost that Syro has quite a lot of expertise in MIR and NIR analysis of both soils but other geological samples as well. And it's spread across a range of domains. And I think Ian Lau's on, on the line, who comes from minerals. Um, and then I think Sean's going to talk about Ziltec and perhaps what they've been doing or have done with Mike McLaughlin, et cetera, from land and water. But we've been Agriculture, there's myself and Lynn McDonald based at the Wake campus and Uta, who will talk very soon, and Brendan, who's already um, been mentioned, and Peter Wilson and Sanani Karaniratni and Saya and others based at Black Mountain. So quite a lot of us working on, on soil analysis. Um, as Manu mentioned, we've got a pretty strong focus on soil organic matter and in particular types of organic matter, which we simplify using a fractionation process. And as Mano said, it's it's pretty time consuming and, and expensive to do, um, And but it can be predicted reasonably well. And we've got a, a growing library of samples that have been fractionated. And we're thinking about how we can ship that capability out so it gets used by real people in the real world, not just researchers, but there's a growing interest by government and industry as well, because fractions can tell you not just about how much carbon's there, but things like how it's going to cycle, how it's going to respond to perturbation, and um, you know even things like mineralization of of nitrogen and things like that. So we we think there's quite a lot of value to be unlocked, and we're working towards how we can unlock that, and do that in a way that we can continue to improve those predictions, but also people's use of the data that comes from it. So that's the story from Waits, and I'll hand over to Uta to talk about some of our other capability. Thank you, Ryan. I hope you can hear me. Okay, great. I, I don't have any slides either, and yeah, so I thought I, I give you just a, a quick overview of what, what's happening at the Black Mountain side um, in in our spectral world here. So um, over the years, um, we have basically established the national spectral libraries in the mid-infrared and visible near-infrared space based on the National Soil Archive soil specimen. And in our NIR library, we now have accumulated something more than 30,000 spectra. And because of the uh, additional preparations involved, as um, we've heard about uh, previously, um, these, these uh, numbers are lower for our mid-infrared library here. Um, 
at about 5,000 uh, spectra at the moment. But I guess the important thing is that we are continuously adding to these libraries, uh, scanning the soil archive specimen, and these spectra have a varying range of um, analytical soil attributes associated with them. And at the moment, and, and Peter Wilson will talk about this later on as well, we are actually trying to see how we can actually unlock this value and and share our spectral libraries also um, yeah, ac across Australia. So you will hear about more of that effort um, later on. And, and this effort also includes um, considering instrument standardization and also using in the NIR range um, spectra in field condition and, and how we can still use our soil spectra libraries that were um, accumulated based on lab-based soil. So for the NIR, of course, we're talking about air dry and sieve to less than two millimeters. And as we all know, in the mid-infrared, um, further grinding is involved um, as well. And uh, yeah, so we're using these sensors in, in our projects um, as well. And in addition to the mid-infrared and near infrared range, uh, we're also using portable XRF uh, sensors as well. So it's it's also a combination and the complementary use of, of our sensors, particularly also the ones that have field capacity um, that we're looking into. And uh, we're also exploring uh, new ranges of sensors, for example, in the VIS and near infrared that are cheaper, um, not as good as the research grade instruments that we're using here. We're using the pen analytical or formerly known ASD range for this NIR, for example. Um, but these sensors um, show more of an opportunity to actually be reached out uh, on the ground uh, to growers. So we're also looking um, yeah, at, at these instruments as well. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say. You will hear more about our efforts later on. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Uta. That was very, that was good. Um, as I said, it's it's giving everyone a bit of an understanding of where where everybody is in the in this. Well, let's call it an industry, and um, how it's moving forward um, in various different ways. Um, and I and I think one of the things that um, we talked about with Peter was, you know, everyone's sort of off in their own little silos over the last 20 years doing their own thing, trying to get these things, you know, operating in their own laboratories. And um, while there's been evidence of sharing in between uh, different groups, I think um, a, a broader sharing of, of knowledge and experience will probably help us get to the end point eventually. Um, it's <laughs> in the not too distant future, I hope. So um, we had Samantha from RMIT on the list, but unfortunately she's um, got other commitments today uh, that have popped up on her and um, hasn't been able to um, to join us. So uh, Bruce, are you uh, comfortable to, to move on? Yep, sure. <clears throat> Another long-term fighter, go on. Okay, um, so we've been uh, in the MIR space for almost 20 years. Um, we're still running our original Perkin Elmer Spectrum 1 um, laboratory instrument, uh, but we um, that, that supplemented with a Ziltec REM scan, uh, which is basically an Agilent um, scan 4100 handheld uh, MIR. Um, unfortunately, they're no longer available, but we'll get to the consequence of that a little bit later. Uh, that's not our complete list of predictions. That's just the, the one I could fit on the screen. Um, <clears throat> the um, It's all the standard sort of things there, I guess. Um, as was uh, pointed out earlier, um, SCART was the source of our data for our <coughs> carbon and carbon fractions. We use that a lot. 
Um, similarly, PSA uh, gets used uh, or requested a lot. Um, <clears throat> we are currently working on fuel capacity and wilting point. Um, and again, as pointed out earlier, um, <clears throat> the issue with that is um, the, the attributes that you're measuring in the spectra are a long way from the actual component that we're interested in. Um, the only thing to point out there, I guess, is we've had a bit of a crack using support vector machine um, as well, uh, against the traditional PLS. Um, you can see that there are slight improvements, <coughs> more particularly in the error. Um, same thing here. Um, so there shouldn't be an assumption that machine learning type uh, processes are necessarily any better than PLS and they're a lot more complicated. So um, I, I just point that out there. Um, the rest of it's all pretty standard. Oh, I will point out, um, you know, we're, we're aiming 0.7 is one of the low ones, but um, in terms of what we offer, uh, unless it's a specific research application that we're developing, um, all of these are all up around that 0.9 um, with reasonable um, errors. Uh, so that's the sort of public table that we put out. Um, handheld, um, much more limited range of calibrations that we've got in that. Um, this is actually off a presentation I, I did for a farmer day. So uh, the predicted value is actually for a, a local soil and pretty meaningless for, <laughs> for this. Um, handheld versus laboratory MIR. Um, the Spectrum 1 actually covers a fair bit of the N or the top part of the NIR range, and there's actually inf information there that uh, adds to the um, reliability of predictions. When you get to the handheld, um, and the handheld, uh, this is not on a, a, a ground sample like we use for the laboratory. Um, this is actually on a PED, um, but it just shows you, you know, slightly shorter um, uh, scanning time. Um, it gets fairly noisy um, and you've got a lot less spectral information. Um, you're missing all of these tones here. So for some parameters, it's really significant. For others, it's not that significant. Um, <clears throat> sample prep, uh, we were using the SCARP protocol before it was a SCARP protocol. It was the standard way we were preparing samples. Um, as I've mentioned in, in other um, forums, there's a relationship between um, the wavelength that you're measuring and particle size. Um, that's pretty well known and it does mean that um, for reliable scanning um, and reliable results, you really need to use a fine grind. So we we just use a zirconia swing ring mill, and yes, it does increase the time and the cost. Um, all of our work has primarily been focused uh, up until a few years ago on servicing research needs, so it needed to be perfect, if you like. Um, the big issue we find some source samples. It doesn't matter whether you're using less than two mil, um, but for others, it's it's critical that you're using fine grind. Uh, we just have one system uh, rather than trying to figure out what the soil's like, whether it, we get by with two mil or not. We just have a one size fits all. Um, we do have an auto sampler. Um, at the moment, we hand load into a single sample holder. Um, part of the reason for that is we found that um, one person working could work almost as quickly as the um, perhaps somewhat archaic aftermarket or third party um, auto sampler that we're using. Um, again, for research, you know, high throughput in short time just isn't that big an issue. Uh, what we have found though is interoperator areas, error can be an issue. So that's the difference between different operators in the way they actually load the sample holder. Um, again, that's significantly minimised by fine grind. Um, it was much more of an issue when we were attempting to use two millimetre. Um, and of course, MIR is really only looking at a a surface that's you know, three or four mil in diameter as opposed to NIR where it might actually be on a carousel and you're actually scanning a much larger surface area. Um, field samples, the aim was always to use the natural surface. Um, the, the idea was that this, this could be used in field, um, particularly when we're doing um, a lot of uh, 3D uh, field 
digital soil mapping um, and we were able to do real time analysis on the core um, in Victoria, unless you go out in winter, certainly up in the northern part, um, you pull cores out, they're pretty dry most of the year. Um, but it's a surface phenomenon in terms of MIR, so you've only got to have the surface dry. We just leave them out in the sun and the wind for 10 minutes or so, and they seem to be fine. The real issue with uh, getting good spectra is the surface is complex and non-uniform, so we're still trying to develop a work on an acceptable protocol uh, or fit for purpose protocol um, in that in that area. Calibration, we've got 35,000 so, 35, samples in the Victorian soil archive. We actually have more than that and, and the extras have been scanned, um, but the additional ones don't have a lot of um, analytical data associated with it. Um, as was pointed out with, uh, with an earlier presentation, again, all the soil samples were analysed in the one lab, albeit over time. Uh, and one shouldn't assume that the one lab um, will produce uh, comparable data, um, reproducible data over time because there are subtle variations on methods, even though the substantive methods the same. Um, and that can be an issue. So, um, how do we do it? We actually separate um, calibration and validation data sets, and that's another trip uh, for young players. That That is the only way to do it. You just can't use um, a subset of your validation set for, uh, sorry, a subset of your calibration set for validation. It just doesn't work. You, you end up with, um, well, particularly R squares that look a lot better than they should be, but um, this is the, 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 the way it should be done. Um, the only variation on that is for some things like total phosphorus, we actually divide that into concentration ranges, then randomly select within that range for our calibration data sets. Uh, we also use Kennard Stone to look at the, the spectral uh, bandwidth of the laboratory MIR, and then we use that to select um, a sample subset for handheld MIR because we're not going to go back and run 1,000 samples or 2,000, 3,000, 35,000 samples through, um, and we found that to work pretty good. Um, traditionally, we've used PLS Toolbox uh, with, with MATLAB, um, but over the last few years, we've started using the support vector machines, uh, which was the uh, SVM um, that I talked about before with the soil physical, uh, soil water properties, um, and more recently, we've gone to uh, MathWorks Neuronet. Um, we have a range of calibrations. Uh, we have globals, we have locals, and we have some bespoke calibration, uh, depending on what kind of um, R squared we get for a particular soil parameter. Uh, everyone, I figured everyone was going to put a carbon one up, so I've put a carbon one up. Um, again, that's on our validation set. Um, <clears throat> Not much more to say there. What are we doing with research? We use MIR a lot for site characterization to optimize the actual um, sample points um, and our trial sites. Um, we are also using MIR on um, cores, predominantly using, well, the, the handheld is a, is a work in progress. We don't actually generate data off that for projects. Um, when we do cores, we actually cut them up, bring them back to the lab, prepare them fine grind and, and, and run them that way. Um, and we use that for doing 3D crigging um, for our, our 3D soil maps and we overlay any yield data that we've got with that. So we can actually start identifying um, where, what, where and what subsoil constraint may be uh, there. We're also using it to enhance our Victorian soil information system data sets. That's the primary data set that we use for all of our 3D soil, or any of our dig digital soil mapping, basically. Um, so what we can do is provide predictions for soil parameters that weren't actually, that for which there's actually no wet chemical data. Uh, and in particular, soil physics um, being slow and expensive um, as we become more interested in uh, soil water properties, um, we're starting to go through and develop predictions for data sets that are being used um, in a lot of the current research. Uh, we also use it for harmonisation of contemporary and legacy data. Carbon's a classic example where our traditional data would have been um, Walkley Black. Um, more recently, we use Leco. 
Um, this was highlighted when we went back over some uh, national soil fertility data a few years ago under the Nas National Soil Carbon Program. Uh, and what we found was an apparent increase in carbon right down through the profile. Um, we got these samples out of uh, the CSIRO um, uh, soil archive. Um, and we redid wet chemistry on that and we we're able to build models so we can now put a sample through and do a prediction based on what the original um, organic carbon method was used for those so that we don't have um, an apparent change that's simply an artifact of changing labs or changing methodologies over time um, so and, and so subsequently we're going back into our visas and we're providing that additional data um, to improve, particularly around carbon and, and carbon change over time. Uh, soil functionality and subsoil constraints is really uh, a huge focus on what we're doing now, um, as well as data fusion from other soil proximal sensors to improve the MIR prediction or to improve our predictive models. Uh, mentioned earlier, we're um, using MIR to uh, measure the three critical inputs into uh, PDFs for soil water function. Um, that gives us better results than um, the prediction that we've already calibrated for with soil water function, which is on disturbed sample rather than the intact cores. But we've got a project going at the moment where I'm actually comparing the results uh, because I've got um, samples from um, the intact cores as well as uh, samples in the immediate area that have been um, uh, prepared uh, so they're disturbed. We're going to compare those. Um, MIR work in progress. The protocol for operational um, use of the MIR is is going to be the tricky one with that. It's probably a PhD um, exercise to be honest. Um, soil ameliorants is another area of interest, particularly as we're looking to use more organic materials uh, to address subsoil constraints. Understanding carbon pools and flow because we can um, fractionalise the carbon and the integration of data from multiple sensors um, is uh, this. So some of these issues that are going to affect the whole industry is this question of com uh, comparability, you know, global versus local bo versus bespoke. Um, you know, it's been pointed out earlier, the test sample must fall within the matrix for which the calibration is valid. Sample preparation is, is really critical and I can't remember whether the ASPAC call is asking for just results or whether they want to know what your sample prep is, but we probably should be getting that as well. Um, there's an issue when you've got recalibration or modifications to calibrations. Um, if I run the sample through with my current calibration, how comparable is that to the sample that I would have the same sample run through with my models from three years ago? So particularly with things like carbon where, you know, it's slow change and you're talking about 10 years minimum. Uh, that will impact uh, the value of, of, of the, uh, the two uh, results. Sample prep we've already covered. Um, stable lab environments critical for new players. Um, temperature and moisture, um, particularly at the NIR end, um, that's where we most notice the effect of moisture. Um, consistency of predictions between labs. Um, you know, it's important that NADA are involved now in running proficiency because um, if we're not getting reasonably consistent results lab to lab, uh, that will be a risk to the actual credibility of the technique um, and, and, and that's a big thing. Um, and QC and uncertainty of the predictions is a is a, a, an area that we're going to have to get a, a grip on as well. Thanks, Thanks. Bruce. Um, excellent. They are obviously, as we as expected, we're running over time, but I think it's important that we um, we keep going with these presentations because they're um, they're giving everybody an understanding of of um, how people are using it. So if you can un unshare Bruce and Phil Bloch from from Des in Queensland. Okay, can you see it? Yep. Good. Okay, so I'm going to describe how we do it, do the MIR 
predictions in the chemistry center in the department of environment and science in, in queensland government now our equipment is a perkin elmer frontier ftir spectrometer it's equipped with a, a pike auto sampler which holds about 60 sample cups and it reads uh, between 7,800 to 400 wave numbers, which is the MIR and part of the NIR, but we use the uh, MIR region. Now, uh, for MIR prediction, the samples are ground to less than 0.5 millimeter. Um, the, and then we take the spectra of four separate subsamples and then average those. Now, how do we decide on four, four replicates? Well, we looked at the spectral variability for increasing number of, of reps, and this is the uh, plots for a, for a number of soil types. And you can see that at about four reps, the uh, spectral variability starts to, starts to stabilise. Um, the worst ones were the, the sandier soils, which are the green lines. And this is this sort of relationship is also reflected in the width of the um, confidence interval for the prediction of clay. You can see after about four reps, the confidence interval sort of settles down. Now, uh, our calibration strategy, we uh, are starting materials about five and a half thousand soil samples with spectra, but we had an incomplete analytical data set. It is too expensive to complete the analytical data set on all the samples. So we wanted to choose a smaller calibration set and only analyze this set. Now to choose the uh, calibration samples, we con um, converted the spectra into principal component scores. And then we uh, uniformly sampled the spectral variability. In, this, in the diagram, you can see that um, the, the red dots are, are our uh, sample, uniform sample. So it sort of covers the most of the variability in, uh, shown in the diagram. Then we had to decide on how big a calibration set to use. Uh, we had some data for total organic carbon. So we looked at the uh, how the error for the prediction of the total organic carbon changed as we increased the calibration set size. And you can see that uh, the error uh, reduced and then start to stabilize at about 500 samples. This is also reflected in the, uh, the variance of the scores for the first principal component. You can see it's a, it's a sort of in change in, in slope here at about 500. So we decided to use a calibration set of 500. Uh, we completed the anal analytical set on those, and we used the same set for all the calibrations. Now, the analytes we looked at were 15 bar moisture, uh, exchangeable calcium and magnesium, geomass total carbon, nitrogen, organic carbon, and clay, and of course, and fine sand. For each of those, we use three different models, the uh, cubist partially squares, the point vector machines, um, and use those in combination with various uh, in various combinations of pre-processing steps. And at the end here, you can see that this is the prediction of an independent validation set. So we got the R squared root mean squared error. The um, uh, 15 bar moisture is about 0.88. All the others are above 0.9. So that's it in a nutshell. Thanks, Phil. Um, and again, that was, um, I asked Phil to do that because it's just a slightly different way of selecting calibration sets. Um, just a, an example of it. Now, um, I'd like to um, call on Phil, if you'd like to unshare. Oh, I have, haven't I? Nope. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> How's that? That's better. And uh, so Sean from Ziltec in South Australia. So we just want to have a little bit of a, a change of um, speed. So Sean, are you ready to go? Yep, I'm ready to go. Can people see? Yep. Beautiful. Thank okay. you. Okay. So I've got a 
different background here to pretty much everyone, I'd say, because um, although we're doing MIR, um, our application has so far at least been uh, looking at um, oil contaminated soils. So just to give a bit of a background, the um, Ziltec license, some IP from CSIRO that was generated by um, Les Janik and Mike McLaughlin and co um, back in about 2010, and it was a MIR method for soil TPH, so that's total petroleum hydrocarbon measurements. Um, the way it all comes together is we've been using retrofitted Agilent 4100s uh, that were referred to um, just before, and it was mentioned that they've been discontinued. They have been discontinued for quite a while. We've had an exclusive purchasing arrangement with Agilent for, for a while now, and, um, and they've actually, uh, that's been, that's finished. So we, I think we bought the last one just the other day. Um, so we're transitioning our technology to their upgraded platform, the 4300 top scan, but um, that's still in the works. Anyway, uh, so we've developed a bunch of calibration methods and procedures for uh, measuring um, contaminated soils and uh, around that. So we have to have this sort of packaged product that um, non-experts can use. Most of our operators you know, don't have PhDs. Um, in fact, a lot of them are um, you know, poorly educated um, Indonesian guys and, and lots of different, um, different kinds of operators uh, working all around the world under companies like Chevron, Shell, Total, um, so like big oil companies, and then um, a lot of the players in the, um, the remediation and uh, environmental management space. Uh, so we have to have a nice user-friendly software interface. We have to have um, a good customer service um, uh, uh, set of procedures so that we can uh, equip people with these instruments, calibrate them for their particular location and, and walk them through that process. And that also includes monitoring calibrations um, as projects go on and, and looking for um, calibration drift and so on and, and then updating those as necessary. Um, instruments have been used all over the place. Uh, in the tropics, we've, we've had a very major project going on in Indonesia for the last few years, uh, cleaning up some horrific um, Chevron crimes. Um, uh, so that's in, you know, very peaty uh, tropical soils. Um, we've had instruments been used in the Arctic. We've got a lot in the US, out, uh, sorry, Australian outback, um, some coastal areas, um, lots of industrial zones, especially around France. And, um, and, and deserts like in the Middle East. Um, okay, so, so presently what we're offering, so you can sort of see the, the kit that we have down the bottom there. There's the, the, scan, the um, REM scan, the, or the 4100. There's a, we use a ruggedized um, GTAC tablet that's got some computing grunt um, to do the predictions and uh, manage data. And we can do a lot of our customer service over that remotely. And then we've got a drying box that we've had to develop with um, sample um, trays and, and whatnot. A lot of that work came out of the Indonesian uh, job. So you imagine their soils are basically always wet. Um, so they needed some kind of um, assembly line process where they could uh, do their sampling, uh, uh, dry the samples and then have them scanned. And on that project alone, they've got uh, seven um, scanners running, I think 12 hours a day um, almost 365 days a year, doing thousands of samples a day. It's, it's, the scale is actually quite crazy, which gives you a bit of an idea about maybe how much oil Chevron might have spilled all around in Indonesia. <clears throat> anyway, so the product basically offers a fast and accurate soil TPH measurement um, with an accuracy of around 100 ppm um, or 100 milligrams per kilogram. It does vary quite a bit um, depending on lots of factors like uh, the local soil types, um, heterogeneity, whether there's a lot of um, interfering species like, um, uh, well, variable interfering species is really the enemy. So uh, lots of varying um, organic content or carbonate content. Uh, when the interfering species is reasonably consistent across the site, we don't really have a huge problem with it. Um, so yeah, it's being used globally for spill cleanup. We've got this user-friendly software that we iterate quite regularly. Um, through feedback with our customers. We offer secure data, data management for all these predictions. As you imagine, uh, these are cleaning up, um, you know, uh, well, okay. So a lot of these sites are, 
um, or a lot of our customers are being forced to do this work. There's some sort of um, legal obligation to clean up, and and so they're often <laughs> unwilling partners. Um, but all that being said, there there is a, a need for that data to be auditable. Um, so we have a, a fairly secure data management system um, built into the software. It also um, in, it provides them with GPS logging, and um, and so we've got a fully field deployable kit, and it provides a a full solution for this rapid infield um, drying and scanning. Uh, and as I also remember, uh, mentioned our uh, remote servicing and support. So that's all very well developed, the, the TPH um, industry. And as I, as I mentioned, you know, we often deal with reluctant customers, which isn't the greatest. Um, we're saving them money, basically. They have some sort of obligation that they need to clean up and, and the scanner offers them a, a means to process control without having to spend a fortune on uh, laboratory assays. Um, but we want to open up the, the markets uh, to this. So now that we're, we're pretty comfortable with our um, TPH product, we're looking at uh, other applications. And that's largely why I'm involved in this um, workshop, because we've been reaching out to various people and I guess popped up on a couple of radars. Um, so we're looking at some of the um, some of the possibilities around um, precision agriculture and carbon capture, carbon capture and storage. So it's things like obviously soil carbon um, and its various um, uh, varieties, as well as soil granulometry and texture, carbonate, pH, and I'm basically preaching to the choir. You guys know a lot of these parameters that can be measured. Um, outside of uh, of those sort of new areas, we've also spent the last several years um, developing a universal soil TPH calibration. So quite a bit of work is done um, in the initial phases of any sort of project where we develop these site-specific um, TPH calibrations for the customers. And um, ideally, especially for smaller projects that don't justify that, that overhead, um, it'd be great if someone could just pull the instrument out of the box and start using it. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time um, using our ever growing database um, to develop some sort of universal calibration. And that's getting quite good. Um, it's never going to be as good as a, as a site specific calibration, but in many cases, the regulatory thresholds for, um, for the cleanup are high enough um, that the uncertainties associated with the universal calibration make it more than useful. Um, we've also got a couple of other little projects. So we've got a tank cleaning and inspection um, application that we've just released. Uh, so that's looking for hydrocarbon residue on metallic surfaces from sort of storage tanks uh, in ships and, and whatnot. Um, in fact, the oil tanker that went aground near Mauritius um, just recently is being um, salvaged and our tech is being used in that. And then we've been looking at some other uh, things like material identification and um, for plastic sorting and recycling or, or any other things. We're quite open-minded about um, what other areas we can move into, and we just try to sniff out the, the the needs from different markets, and if and if it's viable, then we're more than happy to push into it. Um, so our early forays into precision agriculture. I've just got a couple of images on the side there. We went out to a farm at um, at Butte, um, sort of north, well central ish uh, South Australia. Um, and uh, did some mapping out there, uh, just you know, drove around in a ute basically, um, measuring spectra at 100 meter intervals. And we've got some um, soil texture uh, regression models that we've, we've developed. Um, they need a bit of work, but they're, they're doing pretty well. And you can see we've been um, experimentally mapping sand and clay uh, distributions in this paddock, which had been um, pretty well uh, characterized previously. So the the um, agronomist we're working with there has been giving us good feedback on all of that. Um, so that's basically it, pretty short, um, just giving you a sense of what we've done in a sort of adjacent industry and, um, and noting our intentions to uh, make forays into agriculture. Well, thanks, Sean. Uh, Thank I just you. thought that was interesting to have something a little bit different. Um, might just open some thought in some of the people that are using this um, uh, technology. So, Chris, you okay to go? 
Yeah, yeah, uh, and I'll keep it quite brief. I did have some slides, but um, I don't, I don't think I'll use them. Um, I'll be quite brief. There's nothing in there that's not um, public knowledge. So, uh, for those that um, don't know us, it's a CSBP um, large commercial lab in Western Australia. Um, so we started uh, using MIR in 2006, uh, looking at uh, carbon pH. Uh, so by carbon, I mean Walkley Black uh, carbon. Uh, the Dumas method, um, pH and particle size. Um, one of our key challenges was um, being a commercial lab, uh, our mandate is to um, offer things at a low cost um, that are still accurate. Um, and so we found um, that for carbon alone, um, for the, the scale of samples that, that we expect to do, um, it was just as easy, probably easier for us to continue doing Walkley Black um, and uh, without having to um, yeah, worry about those samples that, um, that don't line up properly in the calibration set. Um, but it, it has found a niche for us in particle size where the, the wet chemistry technique is, is quite laborious. Um, so we're using a Perkin Elmer Spectrum 1 with a Pike Auto Sampler. Um, so it's been using that since 2006. Um, we've racked up a calibration or a reference library of in the tens of thousands of samples. Um, we use a Grams AI data processing software, um, which tacks onto the, the Spectrum software um, to, to do our modeling for us. And it's just a partial least squares regression. Um, Sample prep for us again. We're we're limited, and that needs to be able to fit in the in the way that we currently do things to be able to offer value to our customers as a as a cheaper way of doing analysis. Um, so samples are prepared as per CFPP's procedure for MIR, um, which yeah we've spoken about before in, in, in previous presenters. Is it um, is very unorthodox for MIR. Um, you can get away with it more for NIR. Um, so we take about 20 scans across the surface um, for each sample and aggregate that um, aggregate those spectra to try and um, yeah, circumvent the fact that yeah we haven't finally ground the samples um, before uh, getting them ready for analysis on MIR. Um, so we're we're now at a stage um, where we're quite mature with the use of MIR. Um, we, we had a lot of um, help early on um, because you need to have an, we felt we really need to have an expert in the area to um, build your calibration sets. Um, now we're at a point where we continue to build on it, but we're just kind of following the textbook on what was set up in the first place. Um, and it does become a big overhead over a, a big, uh, over a period of time if you need to continually um, build and develop without getting much more out of it. Um, and yeah, we're now at a stage where we're starting to look at, okay, what's next? We've got our equipment that's been there since 2006. And so we're probably more likely to, um, I think Rob spoke about it at the start, there's people that are looking to get into the technology and those that are quite mature. We're kind of in the middle. We're, we're quite mature with what we have, um, but we're now ready to yeah, move on and, and, and start the process again. Um, having learnt um, quite a bit from doing it in the first place, but also uh, the the research and the machine learning and, and all the data processing has changed a hell of a lot since 2006. Um, and we've kind of stuck with the same um, procedure for all that, that time. So, you know, we based around 2008, but it's not the case anymore. Yeah, good points, Chris. So thanks for that. So um, our last speaker is uh, Radeshni Singh. Are you there, mate? I'll just check, hopefully, somehow. See if he's actually made it. Actually, I 
can't see him on the um, on the list of people in. So maybe he has not made it on the to the or having trouble connecting. So um, I think um, we're a little, as I said, we're <laughs> quite a way behind time, but that's fine. Um, everyone's had an opportunity. That's good. Does anyone uh, think, I think we should probably just uh, break for five, ten minutes, if that's fine, uh, give everyone an opportunity. What we've found, if we break for any more than um, five or ten minutes, people start getting into their emails. So uh, we want to avoid that if we can, <laughs> keep everyone focused. Um, so if we can just get back, um, oh, what's the time now, uh, 11.44 and in Brisbane, so if we can sort of reconvene at um, 11.50 Brisbane time, so I think that's 12.50 or whatever, you can work it out yourselves, you're all smart enough. So um, uh, see you at about 11.50.
Okay, hopefully everyone's made it back to their computers. Um, I just asked Sean, are you there, Sean Mason? I am, Rob, yes. Are uh, you right and ready to go? I am. Well, the floor is yours. Yes, Paul. <laughs> Hopefully we can all see that. Um, yeah, so yeah, probably a little bit of a different topic, but hopefully I've uh, reached uh, what you wanted, Rob. But um, yeah, just collaboration with industry. So um, there's a couple of angles at this. So I'm part of Agronomy Solutions, which is essentially a private company in soil and plant nutrition, um, and also linked in basically through shared directors with the commercial uh, lab uh, in Adelaide, so APAL. Um, I guess, yeah, I won't be too long with this, but uh, the personal start with NIR, MIR was um, through the CSIRO group. So you probably noticed some famous names in the IR space on this paper, but, um, and it's been brought up early in the meeting today that, uh, yeah, we essentially used, I've got a background in phosphorus nutrition, sorry, um, and we're looking at, yeah, the mid infrared uh, technology to look at what we use in Australia as a retention index, like a um, phosphorus buffering index. So um, that worked quite well. So that opened my whole headspace with the IR um, technology. And yeah, through expansion, moving on from the University of Adelaide to Agronomy Solutions um, and partner with APAL. Um, the guys from APAL uh, went to a European conference and the IR technology was essentially everywhere at that conference. So uh, the guys thought it was a good idea to purchase one. So we grabbed an FTIR, didn't know what, what to do with it. Um, so in terms of collaboration at this lab level, and Chris touched on CSPP, essentially need an expert to help us. So uh, luckily through the location uh, being in Adelaide, we, we could um, grab onto Les Janik. So um, employed Les for a couple of days a week for a period of time, um, just through some some business grants, etc. So um, anyone that doesn't know Les is probably not in the IR space, but um, yeah, just a pull, a grab of uh, publications with uh, Web of Science of plugging in JANIC and MIR um, pulls up 20 papers, um, highly cited papers. So we were in good hands on an APAL side of things uh, with Les uh, and I guess setting up an instrument and uh, Chris touched on it. Previously, we were, I suppose, being a, a largest commercial lab, we were able to touch base uh, with tens of thousands of samples. We've probably got screened 100,000 samples, but using uh, Unscrambler uh, and large data sets is quite cumbersome once you get to the above 10,000 samples in a calibration. So uh, collaborating with Les was great, um, excellent on the research side of things, and uh, we really needed this uh, instrument to be working uh, on a commercial level. Uh, so yeah, basically with Les going through the all the details uh, of Unscrambler, um, alluded on handling of large data sets, which has become a problem now. Um, possibly people, we can touch on that a bit later. Um, so looking at other data packages, etc., to handle that. Uh, obviously spectral pretreatments, there's a lot of them. Um, Les has got a lot of experience in that. So which one was best for routine quick analysis, um, spectral handling, um, spectral features we know about uh, being IR experts. Uh, something at the lab level, we've touched on the, I suppose, the, um, the director sort of called the instrument a commercial lemon um, as it came to us on the bench. So uh, as it's alluded to, we need four, at least four replicates per sample. The actual carousel that came with had 60 spots so we had about 15 samples that we could do uh, in terms of loading so really on a commercial level when we're seeking high throughput uh, samples uh, per day and peak t period in the thousands uh, was really difficult to handle um, so we've built instrumentation to handle that uh, sample read time again just trying to maximize uh, signal quality spectral quality with uh, read time um, to push samples through um, and I sort of alluded to, to what the, the issues we had with sample throughput. Um, soil sample preparation uh, on a commercial le level, again, Chris has touched on a fine grind. Um, it's probably what we're dealing with at the moment uh, is an issue. Um, 
basically margins and, and turnaround times is is important for a commercial lab. So um, if we're to fine grind everything, that really does set us back. I suppose there is the trade off to uh, sample preparation. So actually pouring the sample into cups, if it's, if it's fine ground and leveling it off, it's actually a lot easier than two mil screen. Um, that's soil type dependent. Um, so that's yeah, just the battles we've we've had to do. Uh, and obviously the, the calibration versus validation data sets, uh, picking the right validation data sets has been touched on. Um, the beauty of having 10 to 20,000 samples in your database calibration set, you can try and hopefully get the scope of clients samples that are coming through the lab currently. So that uh, was the commercial level. Um, hopefully that's an insight um, and Les was great. So occasionally we have to touch on call on Les um, if an issue pops up, but that was a great uh, two year insight to, to really building up this um, powerful instrument on a commercial level. Um, the other side of collaboration uh, is this was with GRDC, so um, for those not familiar with GRDC, it's a, a pharma levy um, government um, corporation. So uh, research directed back to growers um, to yeah, obviously increase production at a farm level. So um, they did an innovation round. We thought we'd throw in a, a project, um, obviously work history with Mike McLaughlin and Les Jennings of the Lights. Um, the idea was to flow on uh, the work from the lab, so they've compared a whole range of uh, NIR and M MIR instruments on prepared samples at the lab level. Um, so it was touched on previously, NIR um, has become quite cheap. Um, there are samples or instruments out there for only one or two thousand dollars, but their actual performance um, matches their sort of cost at the moment, reduced wavelengths and etc. So uh, that was the outcomes of that project. The best instrument uh, that alluding to field environments was a spectral evolution. It's pri quite pricey um, from the US. Uh, so that's what we plugged into the innovation grant to test uh, in field. So the innovation grant was basically to get a research idea um, to a closer to a commercial step. Uh, hopefully we've done that. Um, you'll notice myself there with a the backpack, which is quite heavy, um, with an optic fibre to the uh, probe. So that's soil absorbance uh, mode. There's also reflectance mode. So um, to run around a paddock uh, with a bat heavy backpack is probably not practical at the moment. So there are there is a fair bit of gap of getting this technology um, to an automated soil corer, um, if that's the way to go, um, to speed up that that precision egg that's been on that's been touched on. So just quickly, uh, what we did with this project. So uh, there was six focus paddocks, um, similar to Sean Manning's um, protocol. We basically did a, a sample every 100 metres uh, in a grid fashion across the six varying paddocks. So varying soil type, uh, texture, uh, natural variability across a paddock. And we lined up this NIR probe, um, basically taking a core, zero to 10 core, uh, 10 to 20 at some sites and effectively just took the core, put the core in a bucket and scanned it as is. So obviously the NIR has got a larger window. Um, so we we're just interested to see what kind of error or um, reduction in, in performance was um, attained by just doing it simply on, the, on directly onto the core. Uh, that same sample was brought back to the lab. Uh, essentially, we didn't grind it, but we dried it. And uh, so we still had aggregates, et cetera, depending on your soil type, scanned it again. Uh, and then um, at the lab level, we prepared the sample. So that was just a, obviously dried, but um, going through a grinding process and a two mil screen. Uh, so that's the sample prep for commercial wet chem. And that's the sample that went through the, the lab uh, and compared the three stages of scanning with the properties that you can see there, um, and it's already been touched on, um, the capabilities of NIR and MIR. So they, this, the uh, obviously coefficient determination, a pretty easy one to to look at um, calibrations. This is on a validation set. Um, obviously, we can look at um, errors, uh, but that's yeah, pretty much paints a picture of of this data set. So. We were quite surprised that the errors at a field state out, out in exposed environment um, was not more significant. Um, definitely was some for some parameters, but yeah, the overall performance, maybe at a grower and for information level, uh, did offer potential. So 
uh, that was touching base with JC industry. Um, so they're, yeah, they're sort of keen at that level to get this uh, definitely into a, a commercial, pra well, a practical commercial level on the pre precision egg space. I guess the there is a fair bit of interest, uh, particularly in precision ag and grid sampling and sampling in zones. Um, so we did get a little bit of exposure in this. So um, there's a company, uh, precision ag company, SPA, um, managed to get on the uh, on the front cover, but also a nice article in that. So um, which generated a fair bit of hit, uh, interest. So just yeah, there, the industry is looking at it definitely, um, and I think we can. Um, potentially offer a pretty good service uh, out there as, as a tool in field. Um, Sean Manning, we've mentioned he's, he's put the feelers out um, and we grabbed one of those feelers. So uh, I guess with that NIR, we were um, we chose that because we thought that, that would be um, the most minimal instrument, sorry, instrument with minimal effects to soil moisture. So we did scan soils in the paddock with a decent amount of moisture after rain events. Uh, so we are collaborating with uh, Ziltec just currently uh, using those same samples uh, in unprepared and prepared states, both dried, because um, MIR obviously struggles with moisture present. Uh, so we have got a, a good opportunity to test um, the REM scan on these samples at a paddock level to check uh, heterogeneity and prediction of those parameters that I presented previously. So. Obviously, there's advantages of MIR over NIR. Um, the presence of moisture um, is potentially an issue in field, um, but something yeah, we're obviously testing out. So, uh, with linking in with uh, APAL's analysis capabilities uh, and Ziltec's keenness to go out in the field, and um, by Sean's uh, presentation earlier, I think there's a, a good linkage there and uh, something definitely we can um, work on. And again, this precision ag. Um, capability is, is going to be key um, going forward. Um, carbon credits, carbon farming, uh, texture, uh, phosphorus retention has been quite powerful on a paddock level. Um, the more we can get, the more samples analysed uh, for less dollars is actually going to help the advisor and the grower. I suppose lastly, we have uh, touched base uh, as agronomy solutions with uh, students. So uh, perfect opportunity with this NIR um, to touch base with students and help out on, on some projects. Uh, so there's one, sorry, an honours project last year was looking at uh, precision ag style, the applicability of this NIR instrument to determine uh, soil pH and then also liming requirements. So um, we know we can uh, look at pH, but also liming requirements does factor in uh, texture and organic carbon, which I can do quite well. So um, that presentation here is just a representation of a, a paddock map on, on pH, calcium chloride performed by wet chemistry. So a grid map um, with an NIR predicted map um, using a validation set. So uh, you can see similarities there. Um, I guess we can always improve with, with more samples and uh, sample frequency. Uh, a current PhD candidate, uh, uh, Ruby, at the University of Adelaide is tying in with the GRDC project, uh, which they're looking at um, lime applications, efficient lime applications in, in South Australian or the southern region broadacre agriculture. So soil acidity is, is an emerging um, issue in our environments. Um, so yeah, Ruby's looking at new instrumentation, including MIR and near-infrared uh, to assess Basically, long pH stratification, sorry, acid, acid, acid stratification. So, uh, sample frequency um, at centimetre intervals is, is key um, compared to, a, say, a soil sampling methodology and the wet chemistry involved by coring at very small intervals. So, we've got um, potential benefit there. Um, assessing lime, move, lime movement, sorry. Um, so, we can address pH at the surface quite well by applying lime. It's just getting down there, getting the lime moved uh, to the subsoils where we can get subsoil um, subsoil acidification as well and just generally looking at plant responses in in acidic agricultural systems using the ir and reflectance mode um yeah so that was generally it so hopefully an overview of collaboration we're doing um also csro and ryan looking at the carbon fraction stuff we're very keen in that space as well um just trying to give better interpretation to um 
yeah, the carbon stuff that we're finding in, in the soil. So uh, that was all, Rob. Thank you, and I like uh, mute. mute. <laughs> you can hear myself yeah, back. back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> it's disconcerting when you hear your own voice. Um, Thanks very much, Ryan. And I guess, uh, Sean, sorry, um, just your boss, <laughs> Ryan, we had a fair bit to do with him in um, ASPAC. Uh, so, Sean, uh, thanks for that. That was just an introduction, you know, to the ideas that are going to probably come up later in discussion about collaboration and between industry and research and organisations and government um, that, and universities. So that's great. So, Pierre, um, I, the floor is now yours. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Kia ora, everyone. And um, hopefully you can all see this. Um, so um, I'm, I've just thought I'd, I'd give you a little bit of an update of what's happening on this side of the Tasman. Um, I should also say that very much from a research perspective. So you, you heard from Kyle and, and Roger from Hill Labs um, on what they're, they're up to uh, on the sort of commercial side of things. So that's just very much an update of what we do. Um, as a research institute. Um, so um, I, I guess we, we started to get interested in spectroscopy about 10 years ago, and that was very much because, uh, hopefully that's not gonna, yeah, um, very much because soil vary a lot in space and time, and we're interested interested to map those soil attributes. With, well, that sort of started with, with carbon, but there's a range of soil attributes that, that are of interest for us. And um, we want to find way to measure these that are more efficient in in cost, but also in time. Um, so we all started with uh, visible near infrared spectroscopy. I basically arrived in this country at, uh, at the same time as this instrument here, uh, field spec. Um, well, we got speaker, field spec three and field spec four, uh, which are the ISD instruments, and we started using them in bench mode on um, on uh, sort of tri soils. Um, I, I will skip very quickly on this. So as everyone explained, you know, we need a model um, and to do that, you need to build um, a, a spectral library. Um, and um, one of the great things that is our, at our, at our um, disposal here um, in Palmer's North is the National Soil Archive. So just across the, across the road from my, from my office, we curate about uh, 35,000 uh, soil samples that traced back from 1943, I believe, to, um, to 2020. Uh, so um, all of them are not in the same state. Uh, they are not um, necessarily all digitized, etc. but there's a large amount of soil here that, that's usable to build a library. And um, throughout those last 10 years, we, we scanned um, a large amount of these soils uh, to build our, our NIR spectral library. Um, in terms of attributes measured, you can see um, large discrepancies. So carbon and nitrogen are, um, are definitely the attributes for which we have the most um, the most valued measured. Uh, so we got almost 8,000 uh, samples um, at our disposal when building carbon model, for example, while uh, things like texture, uh, we only have um, a little bit more than 1,000. Um, one of the things we did once we sort of uh, got started on carbon and nitrogen and trying to predict the sort of um, 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 the sort of uh, chemical attributes. We uh, recently got interested in physical sub attributes. So um, following on 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 Boozy talk. So that's <laughs> we've had already our had our share of a good share of uh, discussion on topic with Boozy. But I think I think in the end we sort of agree that you know uh, uh, these are these are relationships that are, are not unlike PTF, and, and I'm, a, I'm a pragmatic person, so the, the sort of validation results were for us good enough uh, to justify trying to, to use spectroscopy to um, predict, in this case, that's fill capacity and permanent wilting point. Uh, and these are two measurements that are really important for a country like New Zealand, where irrigation in particular is developing very quickly. Um, and on the other hand, um, Measuring these things in the lab in New Zealand is extremely time consuming and very, very expensive. And the result is that people just don't measure them, I suppose, <laughs> and, and, and simply don't have the, the evidence base to uh, support 
um, good good policy decisions um, in irrigation, for example. Um, the other thing you can see in this graph is there's two lines, and that's because in this study we we uh, we compared PLS with SVM, but rather than using uh, support vector machines sort of out of the box on the spectra, we we use the PLS to reduce the dimensionality of the data set to extract latent variables, and then we use the, those latent variables as input to um, to machine learning methods um, such as um, such as SVM or random forest or, or Cubist. Um, so yeah, here you can see that that's, that's just the split of, of that performance for fill capacity and permanent wilting ponds, depending on the major, on four major um, soil orders in New Zealand. The, the one we are really most inter interested in is the last one on the right, which is the recent soil. Typically what you'd find in Canterbury where uh, irrigation has been really blooming over the last uh, 10 to 50 years. Um, and, and if you have, if you need more more detail and or well, discussion about whether we should should do this or not, um, that that's in a it's a, in an open access um, um, paper published uh, last year. Uh, so today we we have we have um, twelve thousand plus spectra in the library. That's that's an iterative exercise, which means that it's still growing, right? Um, Something I, I thought I'd mention very briefly is in situ spectroscopy. So we, we've brought those instruments in the field as well. And we were interested in a field scale calibration for solar organic carbon stocks. And to cut the long story short, what we did is to model directly stocks rather than um, predicting person carbon and bulk density and trying to combine them. And uh, um, obviously, um, the great thing about that is uh, once you get that model, you can apply it every centimeter down um, down a, core, a soil core if you want to um, um, to see the sort of fine, fine scale variations uh, alongside the soil core. So that's a centimeter uh, centimeter scale uh, variations of soil carbon estimated from from spectroscopy, um, and that's again in uh, EGSS um, paper. Um, then we sort of more recently. Um, got involved in mini infrared spectroscopy. We thought it sounded bloody good. I'm going to spare you the theory, but um, we invested in that Brooker instrument, which I think arrived here in 2017. Um, and uh, ever since we sort of uh, got used to um, the procedures, etc., it took certainly um, quite a while compared to NIR. It's uh, our experience that's, that's, that's a bit of a step up in terms of um, SOPs. Um, so we um, we fine grind um, um, our um, our samples and then we sort of load them onto a 46 world plate and uh, and um, like someone one of the one of the previous speakers we we do use um, replicates as well so we have four replicates per 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 sample so that sort of limits the the the, the output of these uh, sort of high throughput machines. Um, and again, um, an initial sort of screen uh, should uh, adjust as everyone, you know, very, very good results, especially for carbon clay. Uh, some some really nice results in validation uh, from an initial screening so good that we decided to um, have a sort of a scanning sprint uh, those last few months. So uh, we sort of went to the, to the solar archive and um, and um, scanned a lot more, um, a lot more samples to increase the size of our MIR um, spectral library. Um, I'm going to pass on that one. That's just um, something we've been doing with CES a few years back about um, sort of carbon stock prediction on on soil cores. Uh, but um, I just um, thought I'd, I'd save a bit of time, and 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 that's really the core of the discussion. I, I thought I, I'd mention there's, there's two things that um, I, I think that I'll um, Worth while discussing based on those sort of few years of experience here in New Zealand. Um, the, the one is about cost and accuracy. Um, we always, you know, as you can see, we've been sort of doing the research thing when you want to, to publish papers, etc., and 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 go for the for the highest accuracy possible. Um, and that's really naturally brings you to MIR. Um, we are not sort of at the point where um, we're trying to question whether you know all application needs those um, those sort of accuracies and. And if you're into something like you know, spatial modeling and national scale, maybe something out of NIR might actually be better. And that's that's also linked with cost. Um, what we found is that NIR is really cheap to operate. Um, I think we're sort of down to about five bucks a sample, something like that. For MIR, it's, it's, it's not 
it's not the case because you had a lot more sample prep. It's probably about seven times, I think, more expensive for us to run. And uh, you're getting actually quite close to the to the price of a LICO analysis. So, of course, you can derive a lot more um, a lot more properties out of uh, out of uh, MIR spectra if you have the the spectra library to do so. Um, but in terms of um, time and cost, it, it's it's really um, it's very really different than NIR. The other thing we found is that we grew these activities as research um, experiments, if you want. And very recently, the last two years, there's a lot of data, what I call the data-related question, which are not, you know, we're comfortable now what, of what we can predict, of uh, the sort of statistical tools we need to, to use. The, the difficult stuff was um, to answer questions such as, um, what are the soils that we need to scan from, um, from our uh, archive? Um, how many soils do we have that have a carbon value and an MIR spectra and that are in the top five centimeters, for example, et cetera? So um, that's really raised the question about how do we make spectra, whether NIR or MIR, part of a sort of solid modern data infrastructure? How do we make uh, soil spectra a sort of first class citizen in our soil database? Um, so that's really um, fresh off the oven. Um, so that's, um, I'm just going to demonstrate very briefly how, um, how we sort of try to now serve uh, spectral data alongside um, lab data. So what you see here on the screen, this horrible thing is what the National Soil Data Repository gives you back if you ask nicely for some information, but in this case, texture, cabin, location, depth, and any spectral information. So that's the interesting bits here. So um, those blue, uh, this, in this blue frame, that's basically the metadata about uh, about the horizon. So this is about a, or a soil sample, I should say. So that's his name, um, his reference, etc. The second box in the red is um, the sort of um, typical reference data information, um, the location of um, the location in space of that sample, uh, its depth and uh, information about uh, texture, carbon, and clay. Um, and finally, in the green box, you can see uh, basically a URL that points to, for the VZNIR, an ASD file, and the MIR, the, the last, um, the last uh, line, uh, that's, um, that's an MIR file. And I'm just going to do something I should never do, which is trying to demonstrate that live. Um, you can see that if I load, if I load this into R, I can um, well first I can I can map the sites that are in my collection uh, in my spectral library, but I can also um, I can also run a bit of script that um, basically downloads automatically the um, downloads automatically the spectral file. In this case, I just I just plot it. So I just um, this is just the way we are going in order to sort of serve. Uh, those spectral information alongside all the reference data we, we are curating and uh, most of our processing is done in R. So it will probably eventually it as, a, as a R package. Uh, we, we do have a sort of suite of open source R packages that are truly available, available online. We, we, don't have a, we don't have a book, unfortunately, but, uh, but yeah, if you, if, you, if you email me, I can point you towards those, those different um, of software solutions. So just to wrap up, um, we are sort of um, working with different methods, and I are MIR, and they both have pros and cons. Um, I'm still enough someone that think that MIR is the, the answer to everything, and there's definitely a trade-off between accuracy and cost, um, cost being being either in time or dollars. And finally, we got this um, upcoming challenge, and uh, that's really what that has been focusing my efforts those last few months is making those that stuff operational and and make sure that data can be um, can be properly managed um, in in sort of informatics terms. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pierre. Um, that was interesting. Um, certainly, um, I'm making a list of things here that um, are popping up, um, and we'll go through them a bit later. But uh, certainly, data management and how to how to um, get data uh, moving around is is pretty important. So, Peter, where you go? Yeah. Okay.
<laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what you're seeing here, but I'm not seeing what I want to see. So get back off that. Uh, I think we saw it. Did you? Yeah. Developing a soil. Yeah, it was just a big splash. Developing a soil spectral analysis platform. Yeah, beautiful. Big splot. A big spot. Yeah, good. I just get the rest of my screens because I've got multiple screens running. So apologies for that. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Peter Wilson. I manage the National Soils Information at CSIRO. Um, and this is a presentation on behalf of lots of others who've sort of spoken over bits of today and some concepts and ideas and project that we're currently running around developing a soil spectral analysis platform, if you like. Um, so a little bit different to probably delving into the tech and, and how good is MIR and how good isn't it. Um, what we're really about here is trying to provide um, some value add to the large data sets that CSIRO has and particularly um, that they are national in scope. So um, I guess what I'm seeing is individual organisations and things developing their own capacities um, and calibrations and things and what we want to try and do is get some collaboration in that work so that we can all move forward a little bit. So let's move on. Um, so thanks, Pierre, for a bit of an introduction into some of the um, other elephants that people don't often think about. Um, and the components that we're dealing with here in, in trying to operationalise spectral um, analysis across Australia um, include the data management and the databases that we have to develop to look at those things. Um, a whole bunch of the spectroscopy R&D that we've been hearing about and particularly um, transformations and harmonisations between instruments and between field conditions and sample preps and everything else. Um, trying to wrap that, that up into applications and packages. Um, and so looking at the user needs and the market for that and how we might be able to roll that out in some sort of business um, world. So I'm just going to whip through what we've done so far in our project. Um, First thing for us was to do this data audit. So at the moment, CSIRO has done huge numbers of project um, based spectral analyses. And so we end up with bits and pieces of data all over the place in various formats. Um, it's not centralised. It's very inaccessible if you don't know where it is or what it is. Um, there's very little metadata around how those spectra have been captured or anything else. And worst of all, we lose lots of data from those projects. Um, I'm sure that's not uncommon for people. Um, but moving forward, that's something we really have to consider. So we've done this data audit. Um, you can see there we've looked at the sorts of just trying to capture the projects where that spectral data sits. Um, but importantly, some starting information around the metadata associated with that. So the instruments that it was captured on, the labs that it was captured by, um, some of those sorts of things which become important in the, the future. Um, and now we're moving to pull that all out of these project files and into a stored and managed repository. Still doesn't make it really accessible and usable yet, um, but at least we know where it is and we can start to capture it. So that's step one. Next bit is to say, just like Pierre, how do we start to attach this spectral data to the large sets of um, soils data that we hold in our national soils database? So pretty much on the blue on the left there, we've got um, the National Soils Database, which looks after all of our projects, all of our sites and um, profile descriptions, all the field data that goes there, and the samples that come out of those and the lab results that have been returned for that. So that's pretty much where our database currently stops. What we're looking to include on the right hand side then is capacity to one, actually store the spectra that are now associated with those specimens but also this metadata around the instrument um, and the process by which that spectra was created. Because as we've been hearing, there's some of the issues that we need to know about if we're going to create comparable spectra and um, be able to share some of this data and calibrations and, and models and things. Um, the third part of that, um, so a bit of an extension, I think, to maybe where New Zealand is at the moment is not just storing the spectral file, um, but actually starting to store the calibration models in there uh, and their relationships then to which lab data and which spectra were used to build those models 
and then how those models have been used against new spectra to create um, predictions of, of soil properties. And they can all sit back nicely against the samples that we have in our database. So we're moving down this path um, and that's all because if we want this data to be application and machine readable and accessible so that we can we can build open applications, we have to have it in this sort of managed form. Um, so sitting behind that, of course, is a lot of uh, R&D going on in the spectral space. Brendan, Anita and others, um, Ryan, that are involved in there. And largely we're looking at around this issues of harmonisation between different instruments, um, between the way people are preparing the samples, and then in the NIR space, um, the use of um, spectrometers between the lab conditions that we've built large spectral libraries on um, and the field conditions. So start of that is to have pulled a national reference set out of the um, CSIRO National Soil Archive. So we currently hold about 70,000 specimens in that archive. Um, we've gone through those now and looked for a spatially and spectrally diverse set of soils which represent across the country um, and also that have a range of um, soil properties. Um, well, actually a, a range within the properties that we, we're looking at. Uh, we've picked about 300 specimens as a, um, as a minimum sort of set that can maybe represent Australian soils and we're currently subsampling those that we, so that we can get uh, consistent analytical work done on them. So we'll have a, um, to try and get over that issue of, of matching methods and matching labs and um, analyses over time. So we'll have a new uh, and consistent set of soil properties uh, measured against those. And then we'll have subsamples of those which will be available to scan under um, different conditions, um, different instruments, both within CSIRO and potentially with collaborators and partners outside. Um, this is sort of building on some work that Uta and Brendan and Ryan and others were involved in, in um, thinking about this in a business sense. Uh, and we have a little um, process in CSIRO called On Prime, which uh, forces researchers to think about how they take their research out of the lab and into the real world and who those customers and clients are and start to make interactions with those people. So there was a whole range of organisations and individuals that um, these guys connected and basically came out with the idea that there is a market or, or a need out there and that we should do something to try and solve this to make a significant impact on soil assessments across Australia. Um, pretty big task, so we've got a, uh, we've got a two year project um, and in the first instance, we need to focus on some probably um, market ready deliverables that we might be able to get out there in the next six to 12 months. And we're looking across the two instruments. So in the MIR space, we think the soil carbon fractionation work that is um, reasonably unique within CSIRO and, and um, is requested um, a number of times by different organisations, we'd like to think about ways to get that out. So the issues there, of course, are the harmonisation of the different instruments that labs and others that might want to use these prediction um, calibrations are using and the way that they're preparing the specimens. Um, so we're looking to think, how do we do these transformations of the spectral library towards these other um, instruments? Or do we build bespoke sort of calibrations for others' instruments by converting our spectra into something more comparable to theirs? And then methods for getting that out in, in web-based applications um, and how do we license or make FIFA services and whatever to create operational systems. So this is a little bit different to saying, yes, we can do this in a research sense, but how do we actually get to um, operational um, methods? And really interested to um, hear some of the other presentations around some of these. I think there's some good opportunities for collaboration. In the NIR, um, we're looking at different field-based instruments. So um, the uh, ASD scanner has been taken out onto a core scanner and operationalised by CarbonLink to do carbon 
work. They're interested in uh, maybe being able to predict other properties um, that they don't have calibrations for, and it's not their focus, but that's a value add to their business. Um, and new sensors, new handheld NIR sensors coming on the market um, through Hone Ag, um, which again, we're looking at the feasibility of those um, as a way to get NIR spectroscopy into the paddock. Um, part of that is around building our national soil moisture transformation matrix so we can deal with the field based and, and soil moisture issues. Um, and again, whether or not we use national calibrations or we, we spin our uh, NIR library on its head to match those other instruments and, and build bespoke calibrations for those. So that's sort of where we're going. I've got a quick little visualisation, if you like, of how that application or where the sort of thinking is at the moment. So these are the workflows that we're dealing with. So at the moment, internally, we've been able to take the National Soil Archive and the National Soils data and those scans, and we build the spectral library that we've got with a, a range of these calibration models, and we predict soil property estimates, and we spit those out to our modelers um, and other applications. So this is getting routinely used now within CSIRO. Um, projects like the Northern Australian Agricultural Assessments and Rural Burra uh, Research Station um, assessments and things. So we're using this as a process. What we'd really like to do is say, well, OK, there's other labs that want to use this data in the same way or tap into what we're doing. How do we create that? So this is where our spectral reference set comes in and the concept that if multiple organisations scanned the same um, specimen with different instruments, we would be able to create this harmonisation engine. Uh, that would allow then that lab to submit a spectra to the platform, um, transform the spectra into something that can be used in the calibration model and produce a, a prediction for a client. The second option might be to actually spin our national spectral library on its head so that it matches the, uh, the spectra coming from the different instruments from the different labs and create bespoke calibration models for that such that that lab can then do its own bit of business. So there, that's sort of the, the mix of thinking that we're doing uh, in a business development sense and in CSIRO's new world of operating. Now um, we're thinking about how do we cover the costs of providing such a service like that? Um, how do we continuously build improvement in that service? Uh, there's lots of options there that CSIRO now deals in a different way where we could start up companies internally or externally. We can license um, use, we can spit it out if there's government funding, um, do all sorts of things. So really need a, a conversation there with collaborators on, on how that might work, both in um, is there a market to, to support this sort of service and is there people out there that would be interested in delivering it. Um, so yeah, that, that's really a, a very quick overview, um, noting the time. Uh, of the project that we've got and it's really about operationalising the whole system um, and getting this collaboration between organisations and things. So these are the sort of chunks that I'm really keen to now have some discussion on through this workshop. Um, different organisations I think will be interested in different bits, whether it's in the data management and database development side, whether it's in that research component, uh, or in the application end and the operational delivery. So really keen on the following conversations. Thank you. And now I need to find <laughs> the stop sharing screen bit. Has that done it? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, no, no, don't press the button then. <laughs> um, and can you just mute for a sec so I don't get yep. myself back at me? Um, it's quite disconcerting. All right, well, thanks, Peter. And that's really, really interesting stuff. Um, some real thinking going in into that. And um, it'll be interesting to see what comes from the next little bit of the discussion that I believe you promised you would leave. Lead? <laughs> you got me into this. <laughs> um, so um, uh, without further ado, 
Um, I might just um, ask though, um, if everyone's um, okay with sharing um, their presentations, and if uh, if that's so, you could um, send them to me and we could put them up on the web. As I said before, I'm recording this meeting as well, so that would um, can go up as well. And so we've got a bit of a reference to go back to um, if we need to catch up with people. So um, it'd be really greatly appreciated if you could send me your um, presentation, send them in as PDFs if you like, that would be OK. Um, and then we can um, find a way of, uh, of putting them up to share. Um, all right, so Peter, not sure how you, you thought this next bit through, but um, up to you. And I hope one of those presents behind you is mine, so. Oh. <laughs> no, I haven't, I haven't got yours yet, mate. But <laughs> um, and I haven't given this a lot of thought. Uh, I know there has been a lot of talking at people in, in this few hours that we've got, and we're probably uh, running out of time, Rob, so we've only really got about another 20 minutes um, to fit an hour and a bit of discussion in. So look, I, I think just opening up to the floor for anybody that um, has got some thoughts about how we might piece together uh, everything that we've just heard in a collaborative sense. Any takers? If not, I'm going to throw a question out there. Um, I'm sort of so I so I don't have a, a detailed background in spectroscopy and things, and I'm coming at this really from a long term operational information infrastructure viewpoint um, and trying to make that data and information usable for others within our organisation and, and outside. So I guess my question is, if we assume the technology on the use of NIR and MIR is operationally mature enough, um, is there a will out there in the world to somehow collaborate such that we can all utilise data and information we have um, on spectra and soil analyses and in building calibrations for local, regional and national um, applications. Is there a will for that to sort of happen or do we think that we should all just beaver away in our own little organisations? Hi, Peter. Pierre here. Um, so this is the, certainly the, an update from for that on on our side of things, as you know. Um, and I think, importantly, it strikes me that there's different levels this can or this should happen already. Um, you know, there's the the whole sort of standard standardization of how we operate the instrument and how we prepare the samples. Um, there's the calibration, the stats themselves. And then there's the whole question that we both um, raised in those two last talks about how do we best represent this um, this data sets alongside the more traditional uh, sort information? Uh, and that's that's because in my experience there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, um, when, when you do some spectro spectroscopy where there's a lot of uh, um, exchange between the, the spectral stuff and the, your sort of traditional uh, national database. And our conclusion was like we can't keep them separately separated. It's too much work and you lose a lot of time and energy. So um, I'm personally quite interested in, in, in those three steps. Um, something that I uh, wasn't also necessarily very much discussed though uh, was what happened when you have you know, um, the same spectral library but you know, different instruments. Yeah. I need to continue. Yeah, please. So I think following on Pierre, I think, I mean, before we start putting together a spectral library and other thing, I think the issue of interoperability between instrument, I think it's quite important. I mean, it's it's good to have a spectral library, but I think from the experience we have, it's it's it it is really very 
uh, different from diff I mean, yeah, even even between instruments. Like for example, we had a uh, Brooker that's already almost 20 years. It recently got service, got changed a bit, and the spectra of the after it's being serviced, it's not exactly the same as it's not the same as before. So we have to rescan some of the library as well because if we use the library from the the before it was service, it's it's going to have a poor uh, prediction. So I think something to do with standard in that. Uh, I think the previous uh, SCARP project that distributed a long few of the samples. I think that's a good start. I think along those lines, I think it would be helpful. I think and then we can start to talk about exchanging spectra, exchanging. Yep. So this concept we've now got of a national spectral reference set of yes. 300 plus samples that could go around and be scanned by individual or by different labs or when you update a machine or something to, is it going to be possible for us to create these sort of transformation matrices to bring everything back to an equal footing? Yeah, I mean, if there's a, if, if, if there is a standard that goes around, I think that that it I mean, it's not going to be perfect, but it is uh, it is going to help us bring everything to the same. Yeah. And then when we then I think it's easier when we talk about uh, how's the settings change. And so. Yeah. So then we can deal with the sample prep methodology differences and uh, soil moisture differences and uh, other elephants that float around out there. I think, yeah, I think also having a standard I think having a standard safe operating procedure, I think that would be helpful. Sorry. Rob, <laughs> that's your game. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. It was a it was the comment that I made um, at the plenary meeting of um, the Glossland Spectroscopy Working Group um, was where they're all getting very very carried away with the. Um, global spectral library and you know the last slide on all this sort of stuff was oh by the way we've got to get some calibration transfer data and I would have thought that would have been the first cab off the rank uh, work out how to do that and then build your library based on what you've learnt um, from that now various people have had a crack at it over the time uh, and that's that's for sure but um, so I guess, yeah, um, it is uh, standard operating procedures. Um, I want to spend about five minutes at the end putting a few thoughts in people's heads for perhaps discuss, uh, thinking and discussion um, at, a, at a, uh, a new year meeting sometime in the, in the new year. But um, yeah, I think um, what you're saying is completely true. Um, there's no doubt about it, uh, particularly around about sample preparation and sample um, uh, uh, presentation. I think um, what we've seen is um, there is some issues with that. Um, but I but I do ask the question, and and this may be another question that we can we can pose at a, a later date. Is we see from the presentations that there's quite a lot of quite a lot of difference in in the way that people are actually addressing this. And it would seem that from just a cursory view that um, some of the calibrations and validation data are pretty good, no matter how they do it. So is it really a problem about how each individual lab or each individual organisation prepares the sample, does the calibrations and the modelling, as long as they get the right result? Or the same result, or a, or a comparable, harmonised result at the end. So there's two train, there's two tracks here. We can go. We can either standardise, or we can harmonise. And um, what's going to be the you know the easiest thing to do, and which is the most uh, going to give us the best future uh, um, outputs? That's that's the issue, because for us. At Glossoland, and I keep making this point at Glossoland, it's not always about the journey, it's about the end, and it's about the fact that the data at the end is um, 
has a uh, good prediction, uh, good precision, and um, reason and fit for purpose uncertainty. Um, I see Sean's got his hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'd just say that um, there's probably a delineation to be made between lab um, instrumentation and measurements and field instrumentation measurements. So all of our sample prep has been de developed around the fact that people just are out in a, you know, away from labs and, and whatnot and don't have uh, or don't want to have um, bits of equipment to do all the sample prep. So we have an extremely minimalist um, sample prep uh, technique, which gets us pretty good results. Um, understandably, you could you could do better if you if you have a very um, regimented and um, refined sample preparation um, procedure in a lab. But so I think that's something to be considered. That um, uh, field instrumentation and laboratory instrumentation are almost necessarily going to have uh, different um, preparation procedures. Yeah, and so I'll just make a comment there too. I think the issue you bring around. The, the results being good enough, fit for purpose. Um, we've got lots of applications out in this space where we're trying to either go uh, not down lab precision world, but actually into something that's quick and dirty, if you like, um, enough to make some management decisions in a, in a farming um, sense, or um, you know, to be able to get state and trends of properties rather than absolutes and things. So. Yeah. Yeah, and that's certainly been um, our impression as well, um, where good is the enemy of, well, great, excellent is the enemy of good enough. Um, and so we're certainly trying to go down that quick and dirty path. Yeah, yeah, I, I, th there's a role. So I guess I've got now a question for some of the labs and the commercial side that's out there as to how, how do you see interacting with um, national data, national collaborative sensors and things. Would you be interested in tapping into a service that provides you that data to build your own calibrations or tapping into a service that provided you calibrations based on a, on a large national data set? How do labs see that working? Yep, so yeah, Chris, you're speaking from my experience. So. Um, you know, we're obviously at a point where, um, you know, you, you, you look to build on um, what you have and you go to the next generation of equipment, perhaps you need help. So there's definitely a, um, definitely a need there. Um, however, if you'd asked me that question a number of years ago where we thought that we were pretty good and, and ahead and a competitive advantage, well, then perhaps the answer might have been very different because it's we've spent you know, a fair amount of money investing in our own calibration set um, and that's one of the real challenges is around IP so if everyone's starting from scratch then national um, libraries very useful everybody benefits but if there's parties that um, feel like their their technology is a, a commercial advantage to them well, then they would understandably be reluctant to participate and add to that data set. Um, additionally, we also have the challenge of um, uh, data privacy as well. So, you know, who, who owns the, the data that goes into it? So as a commercial lab, we take customers' samples. It's their data. Um, we, we can't share the GPS coordinates of where that data has been taken um, because that has a, you know, their, their results with their GPS, you know, that, that's effectively the value of their property. Um, so we would only, yeah, you'd only be able to share a certain level of granularity around um, the data as well, which may be a challenge for a national, um, national library with uh, multiple contributors may be able to add samples in um, but it might not be localized to the the same level as um, what other parties are able to bring yep. any more thoughts or questions Sean? you still got your hand up i don't know if you have more comments or still waiting yep okay <laughs> 
Um, I guess, sorry, Sean Mason here. Um, yeah, I'll just um, support what Chris was saying. Just um, we would battle with investment um, and yeah, sort of trying to get competitive edges and things like that. Um, I know we're always trying to fill gaps, uh, looking at normalised distribution of um, our regressions and that, but just finding soil types that we haven't got in there. Um, so that's always, that's the benefit of a library maybe, and we've tapped into the archive, some of the CSRO stuff for that purposes through Les as well. So that has been a benefit, um, but yeah, really it's, yeah, it's tough to share too much client data. Um, essentially we're in the same boat that they own the data. And yeah, it's difficult, very difficult. Yep, so, so if there was a sort of solution that allowed you to tap into, so rather than, like I know your process, you came to us and had to extract specimens, a small number of specimens really, um, 1700 or something out of the archive. If that capacity was to actually say, well, okay, here's 30,000 scans that you could access, um, would that be of interest? So to, to help you fill those gaps and to build those bespoke calibrations for areas that you're interested in or soil types or, or however we cut and dice that library? Yeah, I mean, the more the more data, the better. Uh, and again, depends where that data sits amongst our library and where our clientele sits, I guess. So, um, yeah, I suppose Chris might be the same, but um, yeah, sort of other sort of labs may have a stranglehold on say northern queensland so that data set may not be applicable but again expansion is always good and we'd be looking at testing our technology to the the wider soil types that we can get um so yeah it's a balance if that answers that question yep bruce uh, I've been around long enough uh, and was involved in the original <clears throat> uh, interlaboratory soil proficiency program that the State Chem Labs of Victoria ran in 1987. The results of that proficiency scared a few of us uh, and that resulted in the formation of ASPAC. Uh, that was the genesis of it. Um, and since then ASPAC have been running proficiency programs. We've assessed the relative uh, performance, shall we say, of laboratories um, <clears throat> and over time with a combination of uh, technical training, um, I guess some incentive uh, around the, the certification that um, ASPAC provides. Um, so there's a bit of a stick, uh, a, a bit of a carrot um, and, <clears throat> you know, on the whole performance has improved. Um, overall, it's improved a fair bit um, and in certain parameters, a hell of a lot. Um, what we need, and, and, and I have been encouraging ASPAC for some years to get into the MIR space um, because this has always been a growing issue and now they are in it and have run proficient or are running proficiency. We need that proficiency to cover a broader range of soil parameters. We then need to look at that and see if the performance is anything like the 1987 into laboratory proficiency program. Um, and if it is, then we need to address the root causes um, through exactly the same approach that ASPAC have used for wet chemistry. So, you know, what are the tricks and traps? Um, Standardisation of methods may be required and may not, <clears throat> uh, but we need to assess what the relative performance is so we know what the beast is that we're trying to manage. So, um, you know, it's fine saying, well, you know, people think they've got a competitive advantage with this, but if it's the wrong result, um, that's not a competitive advantage. That's fooling your customers. So, you know, <clears throat> I think this is the biggest hurdle for MIR. It's the reason why we've been buggerising around with it for 20 years and everybody thinks they've got the best calibration, um, including myself. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, but, but, you know, how good is it? It's got to be fit for purpose. So, you know, research outcomes are different to um, pharma outcomes, <clears throat> uh, which is why we have research labs and we have commercial labs servicing um, the farming community. Fit for purpose is fit for purpose. Um, but until we know how the different labs perform on the same samples, 
Um, and, and I guess not, uh, as, Pat, as we were doing with wet chemistry, we're always trying to find um, you know, the outliers, if you like, to push the boundaries. Um, we may have to look at some different samples in the ASPAC proficiency program uh, for this. Um, but one way or another, until we know the relative performances, we don't know what it is we're dealing with. And if we don't know what we're dealing with, we can't really propose how we're going to fix it or, or yeah, what is it that we're fixing? There may be no problem. I don't believe that will be the case. I think we're going to find there's going to be some significant differences um, for certain parameters. And, and those of us that have been building models for years know some of the those parameters that are a bit more tricky to do. Um, you know, um, and, and in that program, we need to know what the sample prep is that the lab would typically use so we can start to get a handle. When I was running ASPAC proficiency in the early days, I used to run a survey <clears throat> every couple of years. What kind of quality control were you doing? You know, do you run blanks, control samples, sample prep, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I got a bit of a feel for what labs were doing and we use that information to help tailor the training courses. So, you know, I think we need, as we're starting out in this MIR proficiency space, we need to get a handle on what the labs are doing and how they're doing it. And, and also, you know, what is it just PLS? Are they using, uh, what are the statistical packages they're using to build their models and to process data? So, and, and that information should, may give us a bit of an insight into some fundamental causes for the differences. It may be sample prep, but it, but because it's a modelling exercise and a model is a model is a model, um, <clears throat> that's potentially likely to create more of uh, a difference. But we need to really assess the industry as it were, but we need to do it now before it's rolled out too widely. Um, and then we find we've got a problem that's going to be really hard to fix. Roger. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with Bruce and as much as I see that he's trying to get some hard evidence as to what is going on with the relative performance. But some of the fundamental rules are that, you know, you've got to prepare the samples in exactly the same way as the calibration set was prepared. And, uh, and the samples that you have need to be representative, also well represented in the uh, calibration set. So, you know, if we received a source sample that had been collected in Australia, ground in some other lab, finely ground, we wouldn't even want to test it because we would know right from the start that this is probably going to be, um, this is going to be an outlier because of, of the other conditions that I just mentioned. So I, I take Bruce's point and maybe it's worth doing just to see how ugly it is, but it's going to be ugly not necessarily because of the individual models, it's going to be ugly because of the the data set differences and the sample prep differences. Mind you, we have that same problem with the wet chemistry, Roger. <clears throat> we, oh, as Pat puts wet, out a prepared sample, and we all know that in wet chemistry, in ag analysis, the biggest source of error is in fact the sample preparation. And we miss that with, with uh, the interlab proficiency. So yeah, proficiency rounds aren't perfect and they can't be. Um, the other issue you've got is it's a known sample, and, and, and I know from personal experience <coughs> as a NADA assessor that many labs treat those ASPAC samples uh, better than their firstborn um, mm -hmm. because everything hangs off getting certification for so many labs. So, you know, it's, a, it's an imperfect system, <clears throat> but if we don't do something, then we have no idea of what we're facing. Um, once we know what we're facing, then we can start to drill down as long as we've got the information from the labs to um, correlate um, different performances with certain aspects of that information we get in the proficiency. Yeah, I, I guess there's no harm in starting the proficiency early, except that um, it was a bit like when we did the cadmium uh, years and years ago and everybody looks, looked terrible at it because nobody was routinely doing cadmium according to the methodologies that it needed to be done by. So, um, yeah, I think I think everybody's in their own little unique areas and situations, and they may be doing a, a reasonably reasonable quality job there, but once you introduce samples, uh, as we do in the ILCP, I would, I would almost predict that it's going to be, you know, much uglier than what the reality may be because of those differences. Can I just butt in here for a sec? 
um, just to let you know that um, I'm working with our um, social science uh, director here uh, to create a, um, a, uh, a survey to go out to ASPAC members. Uh, and um, hopefully uh, that'll, that'll get um, uh, the OK from the ASPAC executive to send out once, uh, once we've got it, Chris might um, jump in there. But um, I do. I am uh, conscious of the time. And Pierre, did you have something you wanted to add? No, yeah, br briefly um, about sample prep. I think from what, because uh, when I think about the different spectroscopy lab that um, that I've visited, um, one of the reasons why we should try to get a sort of common discussion about sample prep, and that might not be a standardization, it might be just setting up good practices. The reason is that most of the time, people go to their sample prep uh, routine in an ad hoc basis. In other words, by trial and error. It seems to me it's one of these areas where we, you know, there's no, we're simply in a situation where we have incomplete knowledge and um, we try stuff and, and we try to find what's work best for us. So it just strikes me as a as a good example of a situation where sharing uh, sharing experiences, knowledge and trying to get to a common ground uh, on something like this. That you know that's easy, relatively easy, relatively cheap uh, compared to you know the, the data modeling um, that Peter and myself sort of touched on, you know, trying to to get get that stuff working alongside um, a, a sort of national database, that's that's a lot more expensive. But yeah, comparing notes on sample prep, it seems to me the first first step toward um, towards getting to the harmonization and then you know how to compare models and stuff like that. Wrong button. <laughs> um, Actually, well, there's a bit of a crossover there, Pierre, and, and I think what we're talking here, because the whole sample prep, the instrument, the process that you're going through to actually collect the scan, this little thing that you come up with, and actually how yeah, you, you post-process that bit of data, um, seems to me in the discussions we're having internally, is they're the potential sources of error, right, or variance in, in this stuff. So, And it's, it's the things that we don't, capture about our data so that's when we've been doing this data modeling we were saying okay it's not just about taking the, the file from the scanner and sticking that against the thing we actually need to know how that file came into existence um, because that's where we're going to learn where the variances and things are so i guess my question out to the floor is how many people actually record that sort of stuff or is there enough commonality in the processes you have in your lab that you could document that as the yes, this is how we collect our MIR? Um, and then little issues like, yeah, I've replaced the sensor in my scanner at this point. Um, you know, that needs to be recorded somewhere so that you know that all of the things prior to that um, had these issues. Okay. I got a feeling that um, we're probably building up enough um, uh, information or much questions and enough conversation to probably um, fill another three or four hours probably <laughs> in the next year. But I thought what I would, um, and because I know the time is, I thought perhaps I'd better wrap it up and um, and and move it on. Um, what I will do is, is I, I have been just taking a couple of little notes. I think that shares my screen with you. And I've just been dropping down some dot points, not necessarily in um, priority order, um, but um, just as we've been get chronologically as we've been going through the discussion. Um, but um, so things like calibration transfer, these are the, I guess, the elephants of different size in the room, um, the quality and interoperability of the chemistry data. Um, that's um, come out a couple of times now. Sample prep is a constant conversation. Dealing with outliers, um, I think that's, um, that's something that everyone um, uh, has to deal with at some stage. 
interoperator error and how the uh, standard operating some sort of standard operating procedure or or consistency in the way um, we we manage our instruments is um, is necessary. Estimating uncertainty has come up also a couple of times in conversation as something that we need to to get a grip with. The user interface, and I think this is something that I'm pretty keen on because, you know, I, I think if um, someone was to take up the technology from scratch, um, there's not a lot of assistance out there. Uh, there's no package on off the shelf package that comes with the instrument, really, to um, to help you move forward and and start um, uh, using the uh, technology. And as Peter has sort of alluded to, and particularly in the last bit, was the data management and the metadata requirements. And Chris brought up the issue about IP ownership and privacy, and and I guess that uh, that alludes uh, to the the, um, the, dot, the dot point before it in, in the metadata requirements. Well, what is needed? Do we actually need GPS? Do we need you know located location data, um, or is it just the um, the actual soil metadata that um, is most important. So that's just a, a, ca a capture of uh, some of the things that have come out of conversation. I've, if I've missed anything, um, don't hesitate to send, drop me a line um, and <laughs> let me know. Um, and I guess um, on the ASPAC side of things, yes, um, you know, we've been talking about this too at ASPAC. Um, and with Glosalyn and, and around and around and around. And as I said, um, I think there is a possibility we can do some do something. Um, and um, so I think some of the things that we've also talked about is, you know, well, it's reviewing the Glosalyn proposals. I think that's something that needs to be done from this region and how they fit in with what we're doing here and what what some of the proposals proposed projects and 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 things that um, have come up in today's uh, meeting and i'd like to know how we can get organized so we can get this calibration and knowledge transfer in our region a little bit faster a little bit easier and have that connectivity between users and researchers and and different organizations how and if we connect with the Glosalyn um, uh, Working Group and the Glosalyn Initiative, and they're uh, keen to, to try and um, create a regional champion, whether it's a committee chair or an organisation or an institution that could take on that regional champion role um, to progress some of the ideas that we've, cut, we've talked about today. What are the most important issues to work on, re on on regionally? And that's for current users, for new users, and for the developing countries in the Pacific, and you know our neighbours in Southeast Asia as well. And Ken Aspect, what role will we have? Um, we can certainly, you know, do surveys and um, and work with our members, and we can also work outside our members as well. And as Bruce sort of said, you know, we're, we're sort of toying with the idea of the inter-laboratory trials. And maybe it is that it can't be as part of the routine um, proficiency trials that go on. Maybe we need to look at doing something outside um, that that framework that encompasses some of the questions that um, that Roger uh, posed with, with the type of samples that we use and the, um, and the data uh, that goes with them. And so um, that that's, I think, something for us to ponder, and um, I think um, we should work on. So I also just had a bit of a play um, with a bit of a an idea. Um, there are quite a few initiatives floating around, and some I don't know about, but I know N NCST is is uh, talking in this field. The IUSS is, and I think um, Craig Lobsey from USQ has got uh, some understanding of what they're doing. But you have Glosalyn sitting over here, and and they've got a program and initiative going. And how do we uh, make it take either take advantage or or add into that? 
And then what is ASPAC's role? Um, certainly supplying um, members to a, to a user group. Um, I just put that up as a bit of a straw man for people to have a think about. And perhaps um, we um, we convene again in the new year at some stage in a couple of months or something, and um, and, and have a, have a bit of a conversation about how we might actually structure our um, our um, our collaborations and, and and activity to try and get some of that knowledge transfer, particularly the knowledge transfer. Of, We've, we, you know, that's getting stuff from the researchers and the people that are very mature in the development to people that are, uh, are starting out. And Pierre's sort of um, touched on that point as well in his conversation. So if anyone's got any final comments, then um, please share them. Rob, I'd only make a final comment to thank you for pulling this together and for um, initiating the sort of ASPAC connection to this. Very important um, and obviously very keen to progress something after the in the new year if we're all around and doing what we're doing again and uh, maybe setting up some working groups under different components of this to, to see if we can make some progress rather than more discussions because I think we actually need to sit down and start dropping some stuff, some ideas on paper. Yep, work plans and action. Yep. Okay, if um, nobody else has got anything to say, can I still say thank you very, very much for all uh, being keen enough to um, sit through this and uh, and to be involved. It, it was a, not overwhelming, but it was a bit surprising to see so many. Um, want, to, want to take up the invitation. Um, please um, share with me your slides if you're willing to. I do have them recorded, uh, but it would be good to just have them uh, documented so we can have them somewhere. Um, again, thank you very much for your participation and um, we'll be in touch in the new year um, after you've had a bit of a think about it. But uh, please don't hesitate to drop myself and Peter um, an email with any thoughts that you have or any good ideas um, because uh, we're certainly looking for them um, uh, and would appreciate your input most gratefully. Okay, well, thank you very much again and have a good rest of your day and um, we'll um, hopefully catch up shortly. Thank you. Thank you.